Oh my goodness, what a show we're having today. Let's get right into it. All right, I want to get right into it. And what do I do with my intro? Here it is. Hi, welcome to Retro Rangers. It's Captain John. Let's go! Fire. John and the show only happens because I have this fantastic man to work with already. It's Mr. Joe Townsell. Joe Townsell, how are you, sir? I'm doing wonderful, sir, and yourself. I know you're a busy, busy man. I have been working as hard as uh, an average person, which for me is crazy hard. <laughs> uh, most human beings work harder than I do. That's always true. But uh, yeah, this one is, uh, th this one's a big one. And yes, I'm running on a lot of green tea. I will admit that. Uh, <laughs> Barry's with us. Buckle in, kids. He ain't wrong. He no, ain't wrong. Uh, Adida is with us, as is Stevie. And uh, this show is uh, going to be a lot of fun. I am going to be introducing you uh, to someone who's watched the show and been in the comments before. And uh, he is someone with whom I went to college, though he was a few years behind me. Because I'm an old fart, and he is a young up-and-comer, still to this day. Uh, folks, our pleasure to introduce to you Chris Regan. I'm so glad you said that, and I didn't have to say it. I would have pointed it out immediately. That <laughs> I was, yeah, I, I I went to college with Johnny. He was a senior, and I was a freshman. Of course, let's let's uh, let's make that very clear. That's a very <laughs> good way of putting it. And we were in the uh, we were in the same. Uh, uh, comedy group mm -hmm. uh, back at Ithaca College. Do you mention Ithaca College? I never asked you if that was I, okay. Oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, I mention it. They, <laughs> I think they're somewhat familiar with my work. <laughs> they are. They are. Uh, they're very proud of you. You've gone back to speak. I did, haven't you? I did. I spoke at the graduation. Um, I never cashed the check because I never received one. But it, it was it was really an honor to give the commencement address there, and uh, I mean it was terrifying to to uh, give a speech because I absolutely did not want to bomb. I worked on that speech for about seven or eight months. Oh and, my uh, god! Yeah, I, I didn't bomb. It was it was a good crowd of kids. They all seemed um, all seemed pretty exciting. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, we are talking about. William Shatner. This is a very retro Rangers kind of a show because um, Joe and I have all of the um, we have all these nerdy things that we love and we get together and we go, well, maybe we should do a show about this. Maybe we should do a show about that. And we've been talking about Shatner forever, mostly in the way we're going to do the show tonight, which is let's talk about the non Star Trek stuff. Because when it comes to William Shatner, uh, he's just worked like crazy. I yeah. mean, has uh, Chris, uh, can you think of, I, I know there are times when he's taken a little time off, but not much. No, no, I, I don't think any, uh, any time voluntarily. I, um, I, I, I wrote a book with William Shatner in 2011, and uh, I had to do a ton of research about him. Uh, yeah. Mostly because two years previous to the book I wrote, he published an 1,100-page memoir oh. about his entire life. And then I was tasked to write another book that was about his life. So I really had to do as much research as I possibly could just to right. figure out any, uh, you know, turn over any stone mm -hmm. about any anything in his life that he had done that wasn't, you know, um, a part of the previous book he had. Right. But, uh, you do realize what a vast, I hate to use this word, catalog of work he's had. But but he 
Uh, no, he has constantly worked. Acting is very, very important to him. Mm. And he'll kind of, you know, I mean, you look at his IMDb page and there'll be stuff there like, I've never even heard of this. What is this? Yeah. And yeah. he probably doesn't remember it either. But, but you know, like he just kind of shows up in suits and, uh, and, 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 you know, uh, uh, goes back home and rides one of his horses. Now, um, we're going to revisit his horsemanship when we take a peek at King of, Kingdom of the Spiders. Okay. Uh, and I'm very excited to know what you know, because I know he loves to talk about horses and, oh, yeah. and, and uh, you know. And so, uh, I don't know why I'm, why am I in charge of, of putting the, you know. You know, I, I will say the first time, uh, when I, I went to my first meeting with him to talk about the book, I went to his office on Ventura in uh, Studio City here in Los Angeles. Yeah. And I got there early because I, 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 uh, I'm always afraid of being late for things in LA. And um, I got there early and I just kind of walked up the steps to his office. And I'm like, okay, where do I buzz? Where do I buzz? And I looked to the left and there's the office, the window into his office. He was there at his desk reading some kind of magazine about horses. <laughs> it's just like like someone who was in the waiting room of a dentist or something. Oh. And I'm just like, and I'm like, oh, I don't want William Shatner to see me yet. So I turned around and walked down the stairs and walked around the block a couple of times before I started. Yeah. But, but yeah, he's very very passionate about um, his equine friends. Uh, you know, and and it's an expensive hobby, and he has worked hard his whole life. Yeah, why not? Why not enjoy the things you love? I say. <laughs> um, I I do want to throw this one thing out. I I fell down a rabbit hole, and Joe, I never told you about this, so this oh. is the first time you're hearing. <laughs> I fell down a rabbit hole because as I'm going through the uh, biographies, the various biographies, mm-hmm. turns out he was perhaps now, Chris. Maybe you can straighten us up on this. He was perhaps one of the hosts of Howdy Doody. Uh, I didn't, I doubt that. Okay. Like, I, I think I definitely would have dug that up. Because Howdy, <laughs> Do- Howdy Doody was, what years was Howdy, Howdy Doody on? Well, that was 50s and then a, re, a revival in the 70s. Yeah, well, they were talking about 1954. Yeah, I don't think he was in America yet. Right. Yeah. This was okay. So I did a little deeper digging because I really wanted to find some video of this. Um, there was a Canadian version of Howdy Doody. Oh, okay. Oh. That's what you mean. But when you say one of the hosts, one of the hosts. Okay. Now there was a the main host. They decided they were going to go less of Western because they were in Canada. They were going to go more Northern. Okay. So instead of Buffalo Bob. There was Timber Tom. <laughs> now he wasn't Timber Tom. Okay. And and there's also a story that James Dewan was approached to be Timber Tom. <laughs> and that James Dewan said, fine, what does it pay? And they said, Oh, it pays this amount uh, amount. And he goes, Yeah, that's not enough. So no, I'm not gonna <laughs> be your Timber Tom. Uh Timber Tom uh, got sick. Or was it a car accident or something? He was out for a little time. So they created a character named Ranger Bob. <laughs> okay. And so now William Shatner was Ranger Bob. And he was the one talking with Clarabelle. Honk, honk, honk. Damn it, Clarabelle, you're giving me a headache. <laughs> uh, and and talking with Howdy. Howdy, how are you? Um, I don't know. I don't know if any of that was true. Uh, I would love to think it was, but Chris, you never heard anything about that. I never heard anything about this. Uh, I wrote the book in 2010. It came out in 2011. Or uh, no, I, it, it actually it was written and it came out in the same year. It was it was a bit of a rush job, but I would have if that were true. I would have loved to have dedicated a chapter of that. But uh, but yeah, I, I I hadn't heard that. Um, <laughs> the uh... I, I'm really annoying the um, 
the viewers. <laughs> Stop saying Timber Tom. Uh, so the, the peanut gallery, in other words. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> our very own. Yeah, <laughs> okay. if, if you if you've gotten someone named a moral crackpot to turn against you, you've obviously done something wrong. <laughs> <laughs> a long time ago. That that sin happened a long time ago, and and a moral crackpot and I are still paying for that. Okay, so here we go. A moral crackpot, of course, being our friend Stevie, who's going to be on next week, That's right. and we will uh, we will tell folks all about that. So I am going to get us over to this page. Okay, I was getting beat up by blocker. They caught up with me, uh, so my ad blocker is not on. So hopefully, we can get around some of these commercials. This is one of the weirdest clips that I never knew existed. Chris, this is a clip of William Shatner on the Ed Sullivan show. And they are, um, they're promoing the Broadway show, the world of Mary Su Wong? Su Susie Wong. Susie Wong. Thank okay. you very much. Mm -hmm. We can skip through it. We can talk over it. Um, you know, how, however anybody wants to do this, I have checked with all of these clips. By the way, uh, if, if you're a longtime viewer of the show, like Stevie and Adina and Barry, uh, you have seen us get thrown off the air for playing clips we were not allowed to play because, <laughs> I don't know, rules don't matter to me. And uh, so now I test it out, uh, and, and I... Um, oh, did I tell you this? The Columbo clips got me in big trouble. Big, I, I knew there was a problem, but I didn't know it was big trouble. Big trouble. Universal swings a big hammer when you try to show any Columbo. So we get to see a lot of great William Shatner, but uh, but yeah, no Columbo appearances, which is a shame because they're amazing. I, I remember those, and I would have loved to have seen them. I'll just have to check them out privately, I guess. But aren't you, isn't this transformative content that you're? commenting on the the the, the material is not okay uh there are a couple of times a look we're not doing anything outside of fair use and i totally respect your right to your material and you know like just be a real nice guy that's that's what i've tried to do it's worked a couple times but there are other times it hasn't worked at all okay. warner brothers by the way warner brothers don't try them <laughs> 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 a look at this play oh my god um it's it's very cool I'm, I'm proud to show this clip here we go and if you've read in the newspapers broadway's newest smash hit show the spectacular the world of Susie wong has an advanced sale of 800 800 thousand dollars is just it's another, just another feather, feather in the pulitzer prize shuffle of josh, josh Logan, who has been associated with such hits as annie get your gun mr roberts south pacific Picnic, Fanny. The story of the world of Susie Wong begins on a ferry boat on its way from the mainland of China. I'm picturing Ed reading off a gigantic card. Yeah. I don't think it takes much of an imagination or a reach there. Can they go that the ferry boat? The brilliant young Canadian star, William Shatner. So let's welcome him. Brilliant young Canadian star. He certainly was that in 1958. Oh, my. This is so weird. <laughs> I like they were just. Although I was any good or not, I didn't know. Finally, I saved up enough money to give myself two years to find out. Two years with nothing to do but paint. What does the. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> oh, Stevie's going to get irritated. <laughs> the personal trainer, the oh my god i i'm i'm gonna find that ad blocker i swear i am <laughs> someone said to me go to hong kong it's like no other city in the world you may find what you're looking for and now now bill has to work with bill's voiceover and as i looked about me the air seemed to be tingling with excitement and activity it was all beautiful and unknown oh he's not speaking anymore Mysterious. yeah yeah this the is voiceover Special effects on the Ed Sullivan show. Wow. This is what I've been waiting for. Audience, they might suspect it wasn't even him speaking. I'm here. In the voiceover. 
I do love to see his original Just hair. Then a lovely Chinese girl came onto the deck and bought some melon seeds from the vendor. I couldn't take my eyes from her. As she nipped the seed... I'll bet this isn't a play that gets revived much anymore. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, it is Chinese not. girl. <laughs> I, I wish I could do that. Just want to flirt no. with this Chinese I girl. Melon seeds. I just don't seem to be able to manage it. <laughs> well, if you can introduce the star... You mean, I know As a young Canadian you know actor, well, I mean, wouldn't fly today so me. much. <laughs> yes, that should be clear enough. <laughs> Good point. I wonder Good if point. Even, even this actress was so beautiful that Asian. I overcame my natural shyness. Not, Not only terrible. is she Asian, but when they when were going to do the better, movie I'm version, uh, what do you mean the, when they uh, the hang on. Oh, did I say that? When they were going to do the movie version, she was cast, and and uh, Shatner was not. Who's oh. in the movie? Uh, William Powell, if I'm re remembering correctly, and um, and she she got sick, she got ill. Okay, so uh, she was replaced by a, a slightly more experienced movie actress who was also Asian. Okay, but uh, yeah, very uh, very interesting that our bill did not get the call up to Hollywood on this one. Oh, well, I, have to, I have, had to question it because in an era when Mickey Rooney could play an Asian man. Oh, well. <laughs> I, I, I never know for sure during the, during these times. Um, if anybody at home does not know, um, that's from Breakfast at Tiffany's. Yes. <laughs> and probably one of the most vile portrayals of an Asian ever done. S seek it out. Is it a subtle performance, John? And seek it out, admire it. Uh, <laughs> he did everything. He did every. He did the buck teeth. He did the the coke bottle glasses. Like Mickey Rooney touched every evil stereotype there was. You would think we were still at war with Japan the way he did that. But there were there were no Japanese actors at that time. Of course, yeah. Jack Sue was uh, just uh, <laughs> Jack Sue was polishing shoes down at Grand Central Station. Sure, Shira Mafuni could have taken a comic <laughs> turn, not waited until the Spielberg 1941 film. Oh my god, I was that the first American film he ever did? Oh, I wonder. No, I think is he in Grand Prix, the James Gardner? Oh, that's a good question. Or my what about uh, Midway or Tora Tora Tora? Huh. Those are co-productions, right? Possibly. Although, hopefully, we're not just mentioning Japanese roles and assuming they're all Toshiro Mifune. <laughs> well, I mean, you want to get the guy. Uh, but the thing about Toshiro Mifune is there are a lot of American uh, directors who uh, love Kurosawa, so yeah. they were certainly going to you know, like him and admire him through those films. Yeah, I'm just glad that Jackson got his big break on Barney Miller. That's that's what got him. I love the fact that Jack Sue is one of those classic actors who said, "I'm going to see if I can have a career without playing a houseboy or any of these other, you know, heavy duty yeah. stereotype parts." And he did not get as much work as he could have because he turned down those roles. But good for him. He used to work the internment camps. He he did comedy. Yeah, yeah, he was interned. Oh my gosh, I had no idea. Wow, that's a fascinating dude too right there, Jack Sue. Wow, Ed Sullivan's devoting a lot of time to this Broadway play. This is something that they would do, uh, not just Ed Sullivan, but there was also a radio show uh, hosted by Tallulah Bankhead uh, called The Big Show. Okay. And these were New York based shows. And um, as, as you remember from like uh, the tonight show, you know, they would, uh, I guess they still kind of do it. Uh, shows in New York will promote Broadway shows. Wow. And they'll put big numbers or they'll put like 10 minutes worth of the show on. All right. Now, so now, you, Oh, go ahead. Well, then now all you have is the end of the uh, uh, Macy's day parade. <laughs> when they pull up a float with a cast of kinky boots and you know on 34th street and they, they all lip sync to a number uh, by the way it's, it seemed like there was a fun novelty with a man using an abacus just now <laughs> they had a close well, we do have some, some definitely some traditional <laughs> garb here and yes 
are, are you doing math on that abacus? <laughs> are you calculating my bill? The um, so, so, so I get it straight. So Lula Bank did the, the big show, but Ed Sullivan did the big shoe. Is that the distinction? Oh, <laughs> that's a, that's a deep cut, and I tip my imaginary hat to you, sir. <laughs> I'm, I'm imagine imagine hearing this on the radio as well <laughs> yeah well uh, you know this this necessarily wouldn't necessarily make it but um there was a i remember listening to the big show once and there was they were pushing the show billy bud and there's a impassioned sort of courtroom drama scene and the lawyer makes this very impassioned uh speech and that's what they put on the radio which is funny wow. because you know, you know, basically it, the human voice pushed to its loudest, most dramatic level. It, it's funny you mentioned Billy Budd. And because I was going to say this is shot like a Playhouse 90 sort of thing. But yeah. Shatner, Shatner described a production of Billy Budd he was in that was live on TV where he played oh. Billy Budd and Basil Rathbone played, um, uh, I think, Mr. Claggart, uh, Billy Budd's antagonist. And Shatner told me that Basil Rathbone was hammered. Oh, and, um, and in the production, he stepped into a bucket that was on the <laughs> on the deck of the boat. And I've looked all over for this. It's not on YouTube, but um, Basil Rathbone at one point just walked off camera, like just walked off frame to have someone yank this bucket. <laughs> oh, God. Well, I do want to follow up on a, a great comment that Chris just made is that, you know, my, you know, my exposure to Ed Sullivan, for example, yeah, it's like when you did El you had Elvis and the Beatles on. Sure, yeah. but yeah. but these this is an elaborate production. It is. Yeah, it is indeed. Everyone, please ignore this commercial. And here we go. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look they they rehearsed the hell out of this. Look at this camera work. I tell you, in the era of three channels, people were very mm -hmm. patient. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Well, and I, you know. I'm just going by a guess here, but I've always been under this impression. So tell tell me, both of you, um, if you think I'm off the mark here. But I feel like uh, stage work was held in very high regard, and then movies, and at the bottom was television. Oh, absolutely. I would, yeah. Yeah, I, Which, I think this was probably a way of television elevating itself. You know, right. By, by dedicating... 10, 15 minutes of prime time to, <laughs> to yeah. home play. Yeah, well, and let's remember, too, I mean, this is a big Between the Coasts show. Yeah. So if you live in Skokie, you're like, holy cow, I saw a little bit of a Broadway show. Exactly. Yeah, because I, I can't imagine Broadway being that much of a tourist trade funded thing back then. Oh. Like, um, like I... I I remember watching an interview with Jose Ferrer. This might be a deeper dive for a different episode, but talking about how Broadway at one time was so inexpensive that, mm. you know, it was such uh, something that New Yorkers just loved. And there were fans of certain playwrights and actors and stuff like that. True. And as things just became more expensive, Broadway became sort of a tourist trade thing. I'm not sure if this was meant to bring people from Skokie to like, okay, when, when I'm in New York, I'm going to go see the world of Susie Wong with this right. wonderful young Canadian actor. <laughs> By the way, I love, I love the fact that uh, Ed Sullivan, Canadian, was a novelty. <laughs> I, He's you know, a foreigner, you know. Yeah, like, like, like the, the, those Liverpool mop tops hadn't arrived yet. However, we're going to get interracial you kiss. Oh. I was going to say this. This was the first interracial kiss, not the other. Wow. <laughs> At least that's with Bill, good. that's a good one. That's I wonder, a good one. I wonder if that made it to all the affiliates because. Some affiliates didn't show the Star Trek interracial kiss. That's right. And uh, it was, yeah, it was very iffy for quite I, a while there to show anything interracial. I remember uh, the process of writing the book with Shatner was a lot of interviewing Shatner mm. and talking. Mm -hmm. And I asked him about the interracial kiss and its importance. And he really brushed it off saying, well, well, uh, Kirk wasn't himself. Like, like, yeah. like, Kirk, like both Kirk and Uhura were under a spell. So right. he he was really sort of dismissing it as it not being as brave as everyone said it was, like it, like he, he was basically saying had they been of their wits and had they right. kissed that would have been a really big deal and I I was right. kind of surprised to to hear him say that. 
Uh, you know, it is amazing what he considers. I'm just going to uh, drop out of the screen for a bit and just go back to us for a bit. It, I, I didn't, uh, I, I didn't want to bring this up, but it is kind of news. So, um, Joe, uh, I think you and I have discussed this, but Chris, did you see that right now? Paramount, especially Paramount, Paramount Plus. Uh, whenever they brand things with Star Trek, they have replaced Captain Kirk with Ooh. Lieutenant Uhura. Really? <laughs> and, and our friend Bill has gone on a bit of a tirade on former Twitter, now known as X, oh, dear. Uh, for being erased. Wow. Um, I have not seen those tweets. Yeah. That, uh that's unfortunate. I don't think anyone's going to forget Captain Kirk. No. No, <laughs> I, I think it would take more than one ad campaign to erase William Shatner as Captain Kirk or any other character you played. Yeah, so it might have been a little bit touchy there, Bill, if, if I may say. But <laughs> Yeah. And, yeah. yeah, I mean, Kirk hasn't been in the franchise for 30 years. Is that when, is, is that when they, they, uh, they... Exactly, yeah. 30 years when Generations came out. Yeah. But uh, although he has appeared in some of Bill's books, uh, like oh, Kirk, well, yes, he it, yeah, like theories after that, yeah, yeah, like uh, Kirk comes back to life, and I think Ashes of Eden is oh, wow. uh, w w one of the Shatner penned uh, Star Trek. I think I think the first adventures. novel he wrote that brought Kirk back after Generations was simply titled The Return. Oh, okay, all right, yeah. but yes, that was a title that came sometime after that. Yeah. Uh, Chris, did you get any idea um, uh, that you can share with us? If you can't share, you can't share. Uh, did you get any idea with uh, what Bill is like as a writer? Um, well, having written with him um, and, you know, I, I signed a non-disclosure agreement or an, an NDA, as, as they, they, they say in the business. And people ask me, like, did he did he write this book? And I will say the book wouldn't have existed without him because it was basically me putting all of his ideas and stories and thoughts into action, basically. Yeah. Like, I did a lot of the physical writing. In terms of his fiction writing, I can't tell you, because I, I, I didn't participate in that in, any of that. Like, I was given an assignment. This is a, a humor title. It's to be a rule book about what it's like to be William Shatner. And I just, you know, I, I sat with him for ultimately probably around 24 hours and just tried to, you know engage him on all sorts of subjects and sort of hammer that into, you know, a fun little 50,000 word humor book in four months, which is all the time I had. <laughs> that is a, that is a crazy short turnaround. Is that? Yeah. Not? Yeah. Uh, it was a very wow. short turnaround and you know, he's a tough guy yeah. to nail down because sometimes I would call his wonderful assistant Kathleen and say, Hey, is bill free Monday? And she's like, no, he's in Australia for dragon con. Like, uh, <laughs> right. So can he squeeze me in any time in the next few weeks? <laughs> and, um, oh my gosh. But uh, um, I, it was, it, it was a fun experience, but he's, yeah. he's a hard guy to nail down. But, but yeah, I don't know much about his, um, his fiction work. Uh, I do know in his home, there's a very expansive shelf of all his fiction. Like I think he's written 28, 29, 30 books or so. I mean, he is one of those rare TV stars who has a bibliography. Yeah. Has a discography. Mm -hmm. Put out multiple albums <laughs> and a huge filmography. Uh, let's uh, let's get back. I, uh, I've got many more questions I want to ask you, but we should get back into the work of doing this. Um, this is some uh, this is an account called Two Minute Twilight Zone. And okay. they basically cut down all these scenes. And uh, the first one is Nick of Time from Twilight Zone. Okay. So let me uh, let me get the volume up on this because some of these clips are, ooh, oh boy, let's see. Well, this this episode of Twilight Zone is definitely overshadowed um, by his more popular one. Yes. Opinion. Yes. We're building up to the uh, the <laughs> gremlin. It has been decided that your <laughs> See, Need to share, John. Hey, John, you're not sharing, my, my friend. Oh, am I yeah, not sharing? Yeah, I'm sorry. Sure. You've just been watching me watch it. 
<laughs> which is entertaining too that is that's uh that's a bad television right there uh, oh my god see joe's so nice to me <laughs> he was so gentle about the guy that. put it on the screen john <laughs> here we go well, what have we got here? The Mystic Seer. There we go. I love this thing. All right, Joe. What do we ask? Well, nowadays, people would just steal that little rubber head off of it. <laughs> yeah, but somehow it's not complete without the whole mechanism. The worries are over. Forced to do this episode in the thinnest polo shirt. <laughs> and I hope it doesn't get cold. I don't want anyone to see my high beams on. Before we get out of here. <laughs> A lot of his, oh yeah. no, there are buttons. I thought he had it first. I think I had a zipper on Scar like I do tonight. If you move soon, should we stay in here and, until three o'clock? There's no question about it. Every answer seems to do that thing. Joking, aren't you? <laughs> I've got you now. I mean, God, no more. Something bad will happen to us. You dare risk finding out. Don, let's go. Now, I did love this. Am I being mean, or is this not seem like someone to deal with? Treating me like a retarded child or something. <laughs> oh, retarded! More like his um, sister. <laughs> I'm not supposed to say that anymore. <laughs> did he just say the R word? He just <laughs> said the R word. <laughs> hang, on, hang on, let's let's cue that up again. I'm sorry, everybody. Don, let's go. What fact? Six straight answers. Oh, John, Tell please. Oh, stop treating me like a retarded child. Or Damn! Oh, my goodness. Ooh! Stunt woman really scraped her ankle on that one. Mm. That car almost hit us. It was three o'clock. Exactly when that machine said it. Will it still take four hours before the car is ready? Well, it I like these abbreviated Twilight Zones. <laughs> yeah, we're jumping around pretty hard, aren't we? <laughs> well, we reach New York all right now. We're always going to live in St. Louis. Are we going to live in the East? Are we going to live in the West? Are we going to live in this country? Wait, is that chicken and <laughs> not at the same time? No. Are you just going to stay here? I don't know. This machine is predicting our future. Do you think I could just walk away from it? Oh my God, I love. So he's touching her face, and then he caresses the <laughs> fortune thing. Decide your own life. I don't want to know what's going to happen. I don't know about you guys, but I used to watch episodes like this when I was a kid, and I was like, someday I'm going to marry that woman. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody honey, was smart and engaged and funny and pretty. Honey, you're acting so retarded. <laughs> <laughs> we'll drive out of this town and go where we want to go. Anytime right. we please. Don, I love you. I love you too, baby. That's some good chat, right there. Talking down these computers yeah. and future um, work. Leave Ridgeview today. And now the haunted people. Oh, the perfect capper to this story. <laughs> Is there any way out? Thank you, Sixty. Wow. And our I'm apologies to anybody that we just ruined that for. <laughs> All right, hang on. I'm gonna, I'm gonna play this in the background to get past the commercial. I, I think seventy-year-old spoilers don't count, Captain. <laughs> <laughs> that that is a good rule i find that a great rule uh we haven't looked at the uh <laughs> we, we haven't looked at the comments in a while so let's just have a look at some of those uh shatner obviously turned in his work as a captain's log uh okay i went really far back there hey oh uh, yeah <laughs> Am I going back to that one? I think so. Okay. I find it yeah, interesting they're... whoever made this two minute version of the episode decided to leave that reference in. Yeah. <laughs> that I kind of get that. <laughs> the uh <laughs> yeah. You know that uh, diner. It it's so funny when you watch the um Twilight Zone marathons that that, yeah. that that go on on New Year's Day, you realize how white TV was when you get to the um, episode of the Talking Doll with Telly Savalas. Because Telly Savalas comes on, I was like, "Oh, who who is this Greek in the middle of <laughs> like, he's this big hairy ethnic creature in the middle of this episode?" And it's like, "I was just watching Fritz Weaver and and, and William Shaller." And I mean, he's just such 
such a non-white guy in this series where it was just all you know uh mr and mrs smith middle america in the show yeah. and yeah. um but uh but, but yeah, to, to answer the chatter's question, yes, it was. Uh, <laughs> but but I wouldn't expect anyone other than white people to be affected by a devil-headed fortune teller in a diner. <laughs> <laughs> but but Chris, mean, it's interesting you bring up Talking Tina because Talking Tina. That's what right. Shadow would have done with that role. Man, well, he was only in two, he right? Was in two. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That and horror it. Um. Well, well, well which I'm sure we're going to see in a little while, but. <laughs> Um, there, there's a, there's a great made for TV movie that's coming up. Uh, and, and it, it's something, but let's get past this one first. This is of course the cut down version of nightmare 20,000 feet, okay. which is crazy that anyone would do a cut down version. Cause this is all about like now. building tension. <laughs> now see this one strikes more as a shatter bay for some reason. Yeah. Uh, what is it? Ah! So crazy. I'll. There's a man out there. I'll try to tell this quickly. Ah! When I when I saw this for the first time, we were doing a film festival at Ithaca College. Uh, Rod Serling had been you wake up, a friend of Ithaca College. I think he had taught either there or Cornell. Christian. Yeah, he, he he taught at Ithaca. He taught at Ithaca. Yeah. And Cayuga Productions, uh, yeah. Ithaca overlooks the Cayuga. Um, so Serling did have um, a lot of love for our college, and he donated big he reels jumps away of each episode, whenever anyone including might see the cigarette commercials. By the way, really? <laughs> Hurry! So I saw Hurry! this uh, in What's one of on? the like the biography, the uh, biography, uh, biology uh, lecture hall. Did okay. <laughs> I was never in there other than for this film festival. And that's when I saw this for the first time. But I was seeing on a big screen. It was wow. like, that looks crazy bad. Yeah. This, <laughs> this is my favorite part right there. Yeah. That guard never felt that good. So great. You got Teddy Bear. <laughs> Now, Chris, you may know the answer to this, but I had read somewhere that Shatner was interested in playing this role again in the Twilight Zone movie when it was remade. Oh, you know, it it probably wouldn't surprise me, but... Um, but I'm the only one who does know. It was John Lithgow, right? Right now. Yes, the yes, he did okay. the remake. <laughs> Looks like Wilfred. <laughs> it's true. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, I think so nightmare to horror twenty thousand to thirty seven thousand. Okay, I think both of those were written by Richard Matheson. I think oh. he penned uh, uh, both of those episodes. So that, that uh, could be a good call. Matheson man. had Shatner's voice. Matheson is credited with writing an episode of Family Guy, the show I work on. Um, before I got there, I have to ask some questions about how much he was actually involved in that, but. That's amazing. Now, is yeah. he still with us? No, I think he passed away a couple of years ago. But, okay. but you know, he wrote um, uh, 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 I Am Legend is based on his original screenplay. And oh, that's right. It, yeah, just some, which was years ago made into a film with Vincent Price, which I saw recently, The Last Man on Earth. Yeah. That right. I used to watch as a kid all the time on Channel 9 in New York. And yeah. Uh, yeah. I was shocked at how much I remember of it. But it's really a Solid movie, oddly shot in Spain, which I think it's supposed to be futuristic, but it was a Spanish movie with Vincent Price and a cast of Spaniards. And it's one of those things where Vincent Price is, you know, talking as Vincent Price and everyone else is talking in uh, clearly dubbed over, like, I can't believe we're the last men on earth, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I will add this to, to your comment, Chris, is that um, having read I Am Legend, mm -hmm. um, the Last Man on Earth is really of the three is really the most faithful adaption. Really, it just was kind of flattened. The other that's, one being o o Omega Man. Omega Man would be the first or the second adaption, which was way off the okay the mark for the original book, and kind of the same thing for the I Am Legend with Will Smith. Okay, 
but but the last man on earth was a was just a straight adaption of the original book which was only about 110 pages yeah shatner told me some stories about charles beaumont have you guys heard about him oh yeah the big twilight zone writer yeah, yeah. big twilight zone writer I, I, shatner, I mean didn't write any of shatner's episodes but charles beaumont wrote um the roger corman film that shatner was in where shatner played a white supremacist and um oh. <laughs> it it it's famous for being the only Roger Corman movie to ever lose money. And um, uh, it was kind of a run and gun shoot and they were shooting down south, south and dealing with clans people and stuff like that. But it, it's, it has a couple of different names, the intruder, a, a, a few other things, but Shatner plays a guy who's a white supremacist, just trying to drum up, you know, uh, anti school integration, stuff like that down South. But Charles Beaumont wrote it and, Shatner said occasionally he would come to the set plastered and just fall over and this, that, and the other thing. But it turned out Beaumont and his son fell victim to this as well. They don't really know what he suffered from, but overnight he got very, very old and, and, and it dealt with dementia. Hmm. And I think I've read some people say it was a combination of early onset Alzheimer's and something called Pick's disease, which ages you physically. But um, but apparently he was in the early stages of this, and he died when he was thirty eight or thirty nine years old. But at that point, looked like he was way into his seventies, oh and God. um, and yeah, everyone on the set was like, "Oh, he's drunk again." But occasionally, he would just have moments of dementia while he was there working on the rewrites for this particular what film. Nightmare. And uh, yeah, absolutely. And I think his son in the nineteen eighties or nineties died of the same kind of mysterious ailment, but. But yeah, he wrote a ton of Twilight Zone episodes, and Shatner participated in a documentary about him a few years ago, but kind of an interesting character. And I hope I haven't tipped my hat. I hope you don't have clips of the Roger Corman film. But, I do um, not. Okay, do okay. Not. So that's a great <laughs> supplemental piece of information to Perfect. go with what we have. Um, I do love this one. Uh, this is from, if I'm incorrectly, 1974. Uh now was nineteen yeah nineteen seventy four was that the debut year of the Exorcist? Um, I think Exorcist was seventy three. I could be wrong. I think you're correct, Chris. Yes. Okay. Because what I think has happened here, and I'm going to see if I can get. Uh, I can't always get Wikipedia to work while I'm running this show, but uh, yeah, okay. So this is from nineteen seventy three as well. And when did it debut? It debuted on February 13th, 1973. Now, it's about possession. There's okay. there's a level of demonic possession in it. And the early <laughs> 70s had a lot of demonic possession storylines. Yeah. Uh, however, and I, I didn't know this. So I was like, well, is this some lame ripoff of The Exorcist? No, this aired before The Exorcist went into theaters. Wow. Wow. If you remember, The Exorcist debuted in 1973 on December 26th. The, <laughs> it's, the, a great, it's a great Christmas movie. Uh, the the yeah. studio wanted to debut it around Christmas, and the producers were like, no, that is not going to work. <laughs> People are not going to like us. So they, they went the closest you could go to Christmas without being on Christmas, okay. <laughs> and they debuted it. Uh, the day after, but wow. uh, but the novel had been extremely popular, of course, yeah. so it could easily have been um, <laughs> inspired by that. Now, I'd love let me take a look at who put this video up because uh, I gotta give them some major props here, okay? <laughs> <laughs> of course, it's named Turd Mulligans, of course, <laughs> <laughs> Turd Mulligan is one of the greatest cineasts of our time. <laughs> Respect the turd. Um, <laughs> these these are scenes of just Shatner, and I. But this cannot, is a big cast. It's it's an amazing cast too. One of the big characters in this made for TV movie is um, played by Buddy Ebsen. <laughs> All right. Oh, we've got we've got um, Jeb and the Rifleman. And oh, yeah, the, the, uh, Chuck Connors. <laughs> Chuck okay. Connors is in this one. I forgot. Yeah. All right. So <laughs> let's just let's watch as much of this as any of us can stand. <laughs> Made for TV movie. Gotta love it. 
Remember those made for TV movies? Oh, wow. you know, That's I awesome. never knew how much I'd miss them till I see yeah. how many of them are around <laughs> still and they're iconic. And oh, yeah, when I came out to LA to be an actor, they were still making made for TV movies. Okay. Oh, why didn't you cool it? Huh? Why didn't you cool it? It's 1973. Cool it. I'm drinking okay. booze in the tea. I don't care. I mean, you saw that Grumman 15 years ago. Get over it. <laughs> Well, the guitar. <laughs> I'm gonna angrily play my guitar. You know, of course, a little in the off. background, um, Paul Winfield. Close enough. Really, Captain Toro. <laughs> wow. Oh man, why don't you just put me on your back and walk us across the water? Who is she? <laughs> oh, look at that. No, I'd sink. <laughs> Would you like to check your acoustic guitar, ma'am? <laughs> You know that's against the rules? Back in the good old days when the flight attendants, formerly known as stewardesses, wore short skirts and it was just luxury yeah. flying all the way. And is he in the den section the of the plane? <laughs> what? I want my coffee table. I wish I could figure out who she is. And there aren't that many women in in this. <laughs> the glasses on the on the string are great. Did you know this happens to be uh, a Oh well, okay. I'll tell you as much of the story as we can uh as we can trust me to tell. Uh, he is a defrocked priest. <laughs> and he's super, super jaded. <laughs> Those are some nice side drinks. I think that must be Tammy Grimes. I just looked it up here. Tammy Grimes? Is it one? Um, no, maybe not. Well, Tammy Grimes plays Mrs. Pinder. Oh, I'm sorry. Am I talking over the demonic possession? That's Tammy Grimes. Oh, my. Okay. I'm shaking to the core. We need to, we need to get her off the plane shed carpet. <laughs> do it quickly because I got a serious? ear in my ear, my room in my ear controlling me. Some sort. <laughs> Perhaps what would help her most is some food. Are there only 10, only 10 people on this plane? Oh, my, you're right. We really are running behind. Back in the old days. And this is a uh, transatlantic go. flight, too, so. Super and are fan. they are they in the air? I did like the ladies they are. Present okay. when she returns to consciousness. I'm going to go uh, to the, the wife must be Darlene Carr. Okay. The the one in the pantsuit with the <laughs> terrible wig or or this lady. She's this one. Beautiful woman, isn't she? Oh, weird. Don't you think she's kind of hot? <laughs> You're honey, aren't you? For the fainted woman, you are. She's passed out. She won't know anything. I want, and they have Sorry. Some power over no, no, please. I have paternal thing. I, is it just me, or is her hair like aggressively awful? <laughs> like, were they mad at her when she sat down for hair and makeup? It's almost like she's wearing a wig. Is. It really looks like a wig. I'm just Let's, sick from watching you bleed. Let go of my chin, father. <laughs> You're a martyr. A martyr, martyr, martyr. So this is about a demonic possession on a plane. Yes. On a very spacious plane. This is, now, you have to remember the movie Airport was a very, very big freaking deal. Yeah. And, and it, had a, it was a franchise. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry to be such a um, I'm going to, I'm going to lower the uh, volume just a little bit so I can read this. This movie, this made-for-TV movie, was directed by David Lowell Rich. Okay. I'm jumping around in time a little bit. Choo Choo and the Philly Flash. Okay. Uh, Alan Arkin and Carol Burnett. Yes. Okay. And... The Concord Airport 79. Oh, that is such a horrible movie. <laughs> <laughs> now, David Lowell Rich uh, also uh, directed the uh, very well-regarded, um, oh, I'm sorry. Um, it was something, the defection, defection of Simus Kaderka. Do you remember okay. that? 
Or, I I remember reading that in the TV guide listing. Yeah, it was big Emmy winner, and actually Alan Arkin loved working with him so much, and Alan Arkin was highly praised for it. Okay, um, that when he did Choo Choo in the Philly Flash. He hired this, the guy. <laughs> yeah. Which was, by the way, written by Mrs. Arkin. It was written by really? his beautiful wife. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. It's just so now we, we know that the original airplane was a direct takeoff of Zero Hour. Right. right. Shouldn't Airplane 2, since it had Bill Shatner in it, have been a direct takeoff of this film? <laughs> um, Why well, there's only a dozen people on this plane. <laughs> <laughs> Budget. <laughs> That's got to be the budget. Let's all sit in the coffee table section. Of the there, was, there was no budget for extras. They spent it all on these name, you know, list name actors here. He's ma- he's making a meal out of that coffee cup. He too. sure is. <laughs> I'm gonna have one more drink of this coffee. <laughs> you and your wig, are freaking when I was out. when I was in the clergy. <laughs> we've we've lost most of the Buddy Epson scenes. I'm I'm sorry about that, everyone. Um, this is actually a movie I would love to sit down and watch the whole thing. Is Shatner the only living person here? I imagine. Oh my gosh! I, I think we, we've question. lost we've lost Paul Winfield, right? And He's Chuck Connors certainly. And is there who's this guy from the Blues Magoos in the in the red shirt here? Is that... <laughs> no idea. He looks like he might have been a one and done with this film. I'm, I'm guessing. Um, I'm looking through the. Uh, Who's that actor? That, that's, that's Roy Thinnis, right? I don't know. Roy Thinnis was a, a, a much more um, sort of serious, distinguished-looking fella. He was in The Invaders, and yeah, he was a judge on Law and Order quite a bit. Oh, was he? Yeah, like he towards the end of his career. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Good for him. My wife has been hearing. Oh yeah, that's Roy Thinnis. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Oh boy, long hair really suits Roy Thinnis. <laughs> I know him mostly from The Invaders, which uh, that's a show we got to watch one of these. Is that a good show? It's it's interesting. It's super, super interesting. I hear Not it, great, but I, I like it. I hear it influenced Chris Carter for X-Files. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it was, it was definitely a, a certain kind of um, paranoid storytelling. Yeah. He's uh, in The Invaders... He's on the run um, because he discovered the invading aliens and their okay. plot, and no one will believe him. And he's a he's an architect, so it's very much like the fugitive. <laughs> I think well, it, the invaders was, I, as I recall, was a two season deal, yeah, which suffered okay. greatly from an unnecessary retooling in season two. Oh, interesting. where he like was suddenly part of like a, an invader team. Oh, no longer a fugitive, per se. Oh, oh, that's interesting. I'd like to. <laughs> oh, John, I'm glad you're wrong. The buddy was wow. out of it because here he is, manhandling the the shad. I'm John. gonna, I'm gonna kick your ass in this high ceiling plane. <laughs> Take your hands off me, Tin Man. <laughs> if I can't do it, I'll get Jethro. <laughs> Don't don't get me uh, don't make me get Max Bear Jr. What who, uh, hello who are you? <laughs> now he doesn't want to save everybody. Everyone's convinced he can save them. And then he sees the little girl. Uh-oh. I could save her too. Hmm. Yeah, I'm going to talk to or, the thing a little more. Or we could land in 3 hours. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> we can kind of hash it all out then. <laughs> it's it's going to get even crazier. I could I could uh, jump ahead. I don't think you know what. Let's listen to this. Is this the only other Shatner project with an altitude in the 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 Priest, the light of the armchair. <laughs> yes, I looked for a third. You know me. I always like the rule of threes. I look for a third. No, only two with altitudes. In the okay. Time. This is not his best hair period. Aren't you no. afraid? No, I think this is when he's trying to uh, keep what he had. Although, yeah. did he start wearing a piece in like season three of uh, Star Trek? I thought it was earlier. It keeps us from asking why we 
<laughs> the There's fucking upstairs. <laughs> yeah, transatlantic flight used to be a big yeah. deal. Yeah. yeah, it was like luxury time. I'm glad this. Yeah, is I, a I think I think this is an era where Mr. Shatner was probably trying, like you say, John, match up his his uh, piece with his existing here because you can see the line right there at the at the part area. Yeah. yeah. Well, no one's more loaded than the frost priest. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's the thing. The whole the whole movie, he's you know wrestling with the fact that he's he, he's lost his faith. You yeah. know. Those feelings you have in your gut. All nothing more than the stirrings of atoms and molecules. Okay. What a pathetic <laughs> excuse you are for a man. How do you set yourself above anything? You who betrayed your own pitiful faith. Pitiful, Mrs. Oh, wow, man, man don't puke the green side. Powers that are old when they shoot us. <laughs> Powers that you no more can withstand than an ignorant savage. She turns her head all the way around, head for the hills. Uh-oh. Wait a minute. Oh, oh wait a minute. Fire. Mrs. Bender, is that it? No. The way the ancients held off the demons on Midsummer's Eve. Is she a demon too? They built a bonfire on the highest hill. We're at 20 or 30,000. That ought to be high enough. Okay, so I'm going to jump in and tell you uh, some key stuff here. Buddy Ebsen has bought a large piece of a druidic structure, and it is in the plane. <laughs> Now, this, of course, pisses off druids. And Mrs. Pinder, it turns out, is a druid. Wow. Or a, hey, well, that's why she's like druish. Is a piece of Stonehenge a checked item? <laughs> <laughs> Basically. And then those poor, ignorant savages would huddle around the light and smoke, pray for the dawn. At the first shaft of sunlight, demons go back to hell, or wherever it is they come from committed <laughs> yes a fire. well she's the demon why is she afraid of the lighter a fire for the burning of witches <sighs> oh that's Witch. why. i think she's fire. a witch will fire work this movie's yes. bonkers it's crazy isn't it <laughs> giant empty plane yeah you fool you fool you've given them hope for nothing <laughs> we gotta make a fire <laughs> okay so let's on, have a, let's have a bonfire on the plane. Wow. <laughs> Very. Savages. Yes, frightening savages waiting to be led. They will be led. The darkness, <laughs> or into light. Be my guest. Would that I had that strength and purpose. <laughs> oh, doctor. I had to fight a little girl at a movie once. I'm telling you, she was a wild cat. Help me. Help me. Stay out of this, pal. I saw that movie with Linda Blair. What happened to me? Got a commercial. Got a commercial. If anyone on board was in Moby Grape, please call your flight attendant. <laughs> I'm really wondering about that buckskin guy. Torches, as we know, are the most dangerous of all torches. No! No! What? Please. Stop lighting fires on the plane. <laughs> Is this movie in this the, entire, the whole movie's online? <laughs> um, I have not found the whole movie online, but yeah. I think it's this uh, collection. Okay. No collection from this one. <laughs> it is quite a doobie. Happy 420, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah. 
Yeah, I got a good close up on that puss. <laughs> so it's gotten very, very cold in the section of the plane. You'll see the okay. fog. Oh wow. Isn't there a guy in a like a shroud as well? <laughs> oh, look at that. He's a priest again. Oh yeah. Oh, look at that. Did he put his it's like when Batman slides down the bat pole. <laughs> it's a little foggy. I'm of course, the scariest thing in 70s movies, the chanting voices. Double, double, toil and trouble. She must have been a delight to work with. <laughs> there, there it is. There's that look. <laughs> There's definitely no frills flying here. Uh, oh, wait, what happened? <laughs> what, what? Well, see what happens when you keep... Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> when you keep, like... <laughs> you know, wow. outside the window of a moving plane. On December 31st, 2021, Jeff uh, Bezos... Uh, what? The, the, the druids hurled him out of the plane? <laughs> I'm sorry. I just love like the most rushed ending possible. <laughs> oh god. We really need to get to those local news affiliates at eleven. <laughs> Let's just wrap this up. Need a couple more commercials. Wow. Oh, really there's, there's a big star on busing that had to be. Had to be. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that was amazing. But uh so if you're ever looking for the full version of, of that uh Terror at uh, 37,000 feet, I believe. Oh, my God. Horror. And I, I just realized, Joe, that I, I loaded these things up and I didn't use them yet. Oh, oh my goodness. <laughs> Beautiful <laughs> graphics that Joe made for us. <laughs> Those are awesome. Oh, they, they are. are. Oh, both. <laughs> Joe's um, okay. Okay. Uh, I think coming up. Okay, so coming up next is a um, this this is a <laughs> film that Bill made, and Chris, you actually, Bill, had a chapter of the book that was a, um, a Shatter Rules that was a tribute to the movie Incubus. Could we ask you about that? Yeah, um, for those of you who don't know, Incubus was a film shot entirely in Esperanto which was a language developed in the 19th century that was supposedly going to bring all the peoples of the world together as a unified language. And um, oh. uh, very, I mean, a sizable chunk of people in the early 20th century kind of su signed on because it was uh, in various utopian communities. But a guy named Leslie Phillips, I believe, who created the show The Outer Limits, was doing some number crunching one day and discovered that there were 5 million Esperanto speakers around the world. So he thought, why not shoot in a film entirely in Esperanto? And those, if those 5 million people come and spend $4, you know, we'll definitely get our, our negative uh, cost back. But I guess he didn't realize that, like, you know, um, they all don't live together in one spot. <laughs> you know? So it was, it was playing around the world, and some people just didn't go to it because they did not understand what it was in. But... um. But yeah, it was written in Esperanto. Um, Shatner learned his parts phonetically. And uh, I decided, to, because it was a humor title, to write the entire chapter in Esperanto uh, about the, the making of this film. And I, I have not, I have very little Esperanto <laughs> myself. And I began to, I, I kind of began to put my feelers out for people who spoke, uh, 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 who spoke Esperanto. Yeah. At Did one point, I was talking to a fellow who lived in a hotel in downtown L.A., he worked as a dishwasher, and the only way to get a, a hold of him was in a phone in the pay, uh, in the in the hallway of where he was living, and that that proved to be difficult. But eventually, <laughs> I, I found a very nice old lady who lived in Santa Barbara, 
and she was well into her 80s at the time, and she was married to a gentleman who spoke Esperanto fluently, and they lived in uh, this sort of utopian community in, in Santa Barbara. And I think she was one of the one of the few survivors of it. And they all lived there together, and they spoke Esperanto. And, um, you know, she uh, she held on to the language. And I gave her this very silly, funny chapter, and she translated it as best she could. Because I, I don't think Esperanto is necessarily a, a, a humor language. Um, <laughs> what, what, I, what I know about it is kind of a patchwork of different languages put together in, in one sort of language. And we published the entire chapter in Esperanto. And for a while, there was a web page, I think on Shatner's site or maybe on the publisher's site, that had the translation. So in the book, you, you could go to this particular URL and you know figure out what it was you were reading. But it's long since been down, that particular page. So anyone who gets Shatner rules is going to have a chapter, <laughs> unless they speak in Esperanto, um, they're not going to figure out. I have a sub stack, and I think maybe one of these days I'll – I'll publish the actual English version of it. You should do but, that. But it was really, it was really fun talking to this lady because um, she had seen Incubus. Uh, yeah, what did she think of it? Well, she thought that most of the actors' pronunciations were atrocious. Oh, <laughs> because, <laughs> sure. <laughs> because everyone had learned it phonetically, and I think they shot in France somewhere. And oh, um, interesting movie. Conrad Hall is the cinematographer of it who later did uh, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid and American Beauty. And it's a beautifully shot film. It's on very uh, stark, contrasty, a uh, 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 black and white film. Yeah. And uh, just a cursed production from beginning to end. Uh, they're having difficulties with financing throughout the entire time. And um, yeah. Yeah. then it was a lost film for many years because it made no money and the, the negative just disappeared. And... In the early, in the late 90s, someone restored it somehow, and it became a Criterion release, if I'm remembering this correctly. Yeah. And I remember uh, I used to write on The Daily Show, and we actually did a piece about the then VHS re-release of Incubus. And um, we, show, we, we managed to gather a group of Esperanto speakers to watch <laughs> the re-release of it, and all of them had the same note that it was just like, uh Shatner's pronunciation of Esperanto is atrocious. <laughs> but it's a beautiful movie to look at. Um, it is. It's, a, yeah. it's a bit of a chore to get through. Um, but, uh, but, but yeah, uh, there were grand plans for this film that it was really going to revolutionize, you know, like I, I mean, obviously a bit of early narrow casting, just approaching a, an Esperanto audience. But yeah, there were three million people. They were scattered throughout the world. So if this played in a theater, if one person showed up, they, they, <laughs> this is one of the few times where streaming would have been the the savior. Yeah, I mean, yeah, but but um, it's also kind of a cursed movie because there's an actor in it who was later murdered. In a double murder with one of Mickey Rooney's wives, as we get back to Mickey Rooney again, um, oh in a murder that Mickey Rooney was a suspect in for a little while, that this actor was having an affair with Rooney's wife, and someone came in and shot both of them. And oh uh, and I think a, a lot of misfortune befell various people involved with it. But um, yeah, that guy, um, the, the the director of it, who created Out of Limits, seems like he's kind of a character and a bit of a huckster, and might be. A worthy subject of a book himself, but um, yeah, yeah, but uh, I, I it's a film I don't think Shatner had seen in many many years, <laughs> right? Right, so and, so William Shatner at one point spoke it's, it sounds like the two fastest growing languages for a period of time, and that was Esperanto and Klingon. <laughs> <laughs> Does Kirk ever speak Klingon? One line in Star Trek 3. Really? Oh my god, okay. <laughs> to, to trick um Maltz up on the ship to beam him up. Wow, Maltz, surely <laughs> true, or something like that. <laughs> but, but I, yeah, I, I guess it was an international cast, no one involved spoke Esperanto, and yeah, um, you know, and it was a movie that just kind of a weird, quirky picture that sort of vanished that has some things to recommend about it. and it's very much a heavy fable about good and evil, blah, blah, blah. And you're not quite sure where it takes place, but. Um, 
Kind of like right. horror 37,000 feet, it sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take a look. Oh, no, that's not what I want. I think it's 1965. I think I, or, that sounds right. That sounds okay. right. Let's see what we have. Yeah, yeah, I've got 1965 for that. So, so let's... obviously a break in Star Trek that he went to go shoot. Uh, ah, good point. An Esperanto picture in the south of France. Okay, so here is the controversial William Shatner performance in the controversial movie Incubus. With translations by Chris Regan. <laughs> oh, I didn't realize this had a translation. Oh, it's so fun. There, there's subtitles. <laughs> oh, she's a hot little Esperanto herself. <laughs> <laughs> That's some pretty good acting, though. Yeah. Probably take, takes her like 15, 16 minutes just to put on that eyeliner. <laughs> <laughs> huh? All right. Going back to those elves that Stevie was talking oh, I was going to say that you know this is bad because they got ears pointing in different directions. What? I'm surprised. It is some Christian. Hey, <laughs> Same so That's not how that works. <laughs> and what's what's bananas is I don't think it was ever released with subtitles. It was just like they, they were not bringing the mountain to to. to Muhammad at all. It was just like, <laughs> we're making an Esperanto movie. <laughs> Screw you if you don't know what it is, but it's gonna be at, you know it's gonna be at, at your at your local <laughs> Rialto. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm trying to queue up the next uh the next clip and there was no commercial in front of it, so I just dived right <laughs> into it. Uh okay. <laughs> and that's a very good question, Adina. Was that supposed to be romantic? <laughs> I thought so, but then they start talking about being brother and sister. So I do love this take from Barry. Um, isn't that Yiddish? <laughs> <laughs> Happy Passover, by the way, Barry. <laughs> Happy Passover, Barry. Happy Passover. The thing is, I, I think it really does speak to part of Shatner's character, which I it was a big takeaway from when I worked with him. He is so passionate and so serious about acting and yeah. it doesn't matter what the yeah. project is. Yeah. Like he goes there, he takes it very, very seriously. And imagine you're on a network TV show for an hour. I mean, for a year or so um, at that point. And then someone's like, okay, we're shooting a movie in Esperanto. <laughs> you're going to be <laughs> in French for a month. And I'm sure it was just, you know, he really struck me as a fellow who appreciates a challenge. And, you know, I'm you see that in the, in the clip. He's giving it his all. Yeah. He's doing it. You're very you're very much watching a Shatner performance in a, a gibberish language. Right. And, uh, you know, no, a lot of people. No offense. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm sorry to our Esperanto, <laughs> our Esperanto audience. Well, we don't have one anymore. <laughs> but I'm sorry, you're, you're making an excellent point. Buddy. No, no, no. But but he he you know he commits like anything, and uh, I know people give him in certain circles of the internet a lot of crap about his acting. But the one thing that my takeaway was he really thinks about what he's doing and. And he would talk occasionally about his performance of, of as Captain Kirk, but he was like, it was a space opera. Why shouldn't I not be operatic in it? And I'm right, like, right. Absolutely. Like, imagine anyone else playing Captain Kirk. Yes. Uh, you know, we saw Jeffrey Hunter give it a try, right. and it wasn't it wasn't terribly interesting. No, it wasn't. And so they 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 went with with William Shatner, who, you know, delivers a certain type of performance. And um, you know. It's uh, 
you're, I don't think you're ever going to walk away from a Shatner performance. Like I totally didn't notice that actor. <laughs> you know? Well, you can say what you want about William Shatner's acting style. Yeah. But this is totally as a non-actor. It's always dynamic, always compelling. And as yeah. you say, Chris, never forgettable. I mean, you can mock it all you want. You can, he can be parodied, but that man, you know, he, he grabs your attention. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think people who kind of hang on to certain eccentricities in his performances, mm -hmm. um, he was doing the material justice, you know, because yes. he ne not necessarily has been in some of the, the best things, you know, you know, so I, I think he, I, I think he approaches it professionally and I think he gives the material, the performance it deserves often. So I will say that about him. I, I, I think he's a great actor. Uh, he was so. in uh, Judgment at Nuremberg mm -hmm. and very widely praised for uh, his role. I wish I'd gotten a clip of that. I don't know why I didn't think of it. Um, bad. For There's me. always the sequel, John. There's always Chris. the sequel. <laughs> but I did. This is the, the quote that I plucked from Wikipedia. And um, this is something that I always like to remember about him. And I, I, I know you guys know about this as well. Um, Shatner worked as assistant manager and actor at both the Mountain Playhouse in Montreal and the Canadian National Repertory Theater in Ottawa before joining the Stratford Shakespeare Festival in Ontario. Very highly regarded, all, yeah. of, these, all of these theatrical institutions, but mostly Stratford Shakespeare Festival, very highly regarded. His roles at the festival included a part in Marlowe's Tamburlaine, which I don't know very well, uh, and he did later make his Broadway debut in the Broadway production of that uh, Tamburlaine. His brief appearance in the opening scene of a high-profile production of Sophocles' Oedipus Rex uh, introduced him to television viewers around Canada. Then he was in Henry V. He combined playing the minor role of the Duke of Gloucester with understudying uh, the role of the king, Henry, which was played by Christopher Plummer. Christopher Plummer had a kidney stone. And I can tell you personally, those are brutally painful. Yeah, yeah. Those put you out. <laughs> and, and so Christopher Plummer, while trying to get through this kidney stone, uh, Shatner took over and was playing the lead in Henry V. Now, um, da, 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 da. Shatner made the decision to present a distinctive personal interpretation of the role rather than imitating Plummer's version of it, which a lot of understudies would be told to do. Yeah. This impressed Plummer. Seeing it as both a, a uh, show, a manifestation of his initiative and Shatner's potential. And Plummer always admired William Shatner for it. So later when he appears as the Klingon uh, adversary of Captain Kirk's in Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country, uh -huh. there's a huge connection between the two. Yeah. How about that? Yeah, because like that character is always spouting Shakespeare, right? Uh, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We well, have to hear Shakespeare in the original Klingon, Chris. We all know this. <laughs> Now, Shake, uh, uh, Shatner's uh, acclaim was piling up, and a lot of people were really regarding him as like one of the new handsome guys who yeah. could be big in Hollywood. There was a period of time in the late 50s when he was considered on the same level as Steve McQueen, Paul Newman, and Robert Redford. Yeah. However, right before Shatner got the part of Kirk, for Star Trek, there was an article written about him, and he was a Broadway uh, actor at that point, uh, in the New York Times by writer Pat Jordan. And Jordan wrote about his failure to achieve the acclaim accorded to his contemporaries. Brutal. Hmm. Uh, and he attributed it to Shatner's professional philosophy of work equals work. And his consequent participation in many "quote unquote" forgettable projects oh. <laughs> that did his career more harm than good. Uh, Jordan 
an actor who, quote, showed up on time, knew his lines, worked cheap, and always answered his phone. And quote. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, God forbid. <laughs> <laughs> he, he was one of Fox's, 20th Century Fox's last contract players. I didn't know that. And I think he signed the same year as Robert Wagner and Paul Newman. And, uh, you know, th- there was definitely a, some different trajectories there. And, yeah. um, you know, yeah, sure. Because he was in, I think, The Brothers Karamazov was his first English speaking film. He was in a, um, right. and I, I found this film online and he didn't even remember shooting it, but he was in a French Canadian film noir called The Butler's Night Off or something. That was, yes. Made, it was made in 1953. Yes. And he and he's uh, uh, credited as Billy Shatner, and yes. um, it's li- it's there's some French Canadian film archive online, and uh, I remember asking his assistant like, "Hey, tell Bill to have some stories about his first movie," and then I yeah. came to the office that day, and uh, he's like, "All right, the brothers Karamazov, uh, Richard Brooks, director." I'm like, "No, no, 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 no. you made a movie <laughs> before that." He's like, "What?" <laughs> and i called it up on his computer on his desk he's like oh i oh, really <laughs> like, oh, just, so funny. no recollection of it at all and it it's an interesting movie. it's a very hard movie to understand because it's a bunch of because you know shatner grew up in montreal speaking french right. and so it's a lot of um quebecois montreal actors who grew up speaking French, speaking in English. And it's real, it's really tough to understand. And I, I, di- I didn't make it very far in it. Cause I, I think also Shatner may have held it in the same regard. The fact that he, he had totally erased it from his, uh, uh, uh from his bio, but, but now um, it's hard to understand is Esperanto, I assume. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny too, because I didn't realize that he, I mean, I, I knew that Bill was Jewish, but I didn't realize that his family was very conservative yeah very conservative orthodox family mm-hmm. yes his father was a tailor they lived in a jewish neighborhood in montreal yeah. and um yeah he always just kind of felt like and and uh just kind of an outsider and acting was not something anyone in his family ever went into right and um yeah, I, I know he's kind of a punchline for people, but you learn more about him, and he worked really hard to elevate himself up from position and <laughs> explore a trade, a trade that even nowadays seems like, you know, a long shot for, for anybody. He is one of yours, Barry. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> actually, a lot of people, most of the people on the bridge in Star Trek were Jewish, right? You got Nimoy, you got Shatner, you got um, Chekhov. Uh, Walter Ooh, Koenig's Jewish, right? I believe so. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so. <laughs> well, that's awesome. Uh okay, so um let's now take a look at <laughs> <laughs> This is just a tiny little Okay, once again, when I wanted to get into Shatner in the 80s, um TJ Hooker's a, a great example of Shatner in the 80s. Uh the the Star Trek movies actually are are great Shatner work from the 80s. Um but I really got a uh, <laughs> I really got a love for this one clip, and it goes by crazy fast, so you'll have to forgive me. But let's take a look at this clip from T.J. Hooker, and it has probably one of the most emotional scenes that I have ever seen. Leonard Nimoy. Oh yeah, Leonard <laughs> Nimoy is the guest on this particular episode of T.J. Wow. Hooker. It's only 42 <laughs> seconds long, but I, I love wrong. it. They wouldn't have filed without that gun, without that kind of evidence, and you know it. What have you got? You got another voice ID. You just said it yourself. Foster's pushing for another writ, and he'll walk away, Hooker. He'll walk away again. Hey, Mike, you don't turn it around. <laughs> and if he does, you have yourself to thank for it. This is wrong, Paul. Dead wrong. Oh! Hey. Everything you do must get in my way, Hooker. He caught his fist. How about I just catch Leonard's fist? <laughs> you drew blood. Drew blood. And you're running out of it fast. If a man wears this, oh my God! Hey, definitely do not. This. 
Do not pay attention to the woman pointing at the man's ass. I'm going to catch his butt in midair. <laughs> Watch that finger, lady. You don't look like a medical professional. That was you know, pretty um, compelling watching um, Nimoy slug shatter. And not that they acted together before Star Trek um, as well. They were both in an episode of uh, The Man from Uncle together. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. So I they, think. Yeah, I saw that. Um, yeah. I did pass by that on. Uh, yeah, that's worth looking up if you ever want to find that on YouTube. Because uh, Shatner is a very different kind of character, but so is yeah. Nimoy. I'm sorry, Chris, I interrupted. Please. No, it's interesting. We, like, uh, they made a Man from Uncle movie a couple of years ago. When I was a kid, and my parents very much plopped me in front of the TV, I never recall seeing an episode of The Man from Uncle. Like, yeah. I never saw it in syndication anywhere. So it was very weird to me that they rebooted, re rebooted a movie. Like, I don't, do you guys, did you guys ever see it? The original so show? I, yeah. 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 Joe, okay. Do you oh, do you years and years ago. But it, it, as you say, I don't think it was ever a huge hit in syndication. Yeah. I mean, it seemed to really be one of those like Miami Vice kind of things where yeah. it yeah. really caught this sort of prime time zeitgeist and then was sort of quickly forgotten about. But well, one thing I will say about TJ Hooker and working with Shatner was um, occasionally I would talk to him about finances and um, yeah. uh, he really made a great deal of money off that 911 show he did in the late eighties, uh, rescue 911 right. or whatever. Yeah. I forgot all exactly about that. Yeah, yeah. Because he, because he owned it and he helped create the show and it was a big hit in syndication. So he really made bank on it. Oh, I had no idea, well, but God he was blessed. Still, but he was underpaid for TJ Hooker because in the pilot, it was an ensemble piece. It was a bunch of different cops working for this particular unit. Right. And he signed on for a three-year deal as part of an ensemble. And he made the money on ensemble player. And after the pilot, they cut every character and just made the show TJ Hooker. <laughs> so, <laughs> but did they keep him at that rate? They kept him at that rate for three years, the first three seasons. And then he finally negotiated a bigger rate for the yeah. for the renewal and yeah. then they like they moved the show to chicago or something like like yeah. all of tj hooker just left los angeles and became this sort of dark moody like midwestern wintry sort of show <laughs> and <laughs> then people stopped watching and it was canceled almost immediately after i think that's when it became part of the cbs uh crime time after prime time lineup where Gosh. Like at 1130 at night, CBS used to show hour long procedural shows after after the um, the 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 local news affiliate at 11 o'clock. And it, it just used to be kind of old repeats of McLeod and stuff like that. But um, but yeah, I think TJ Hooker was relegated to late night TV eventually at the point where he could actually make some money from it. And, you know, to jump in, um, one of the things that uh, I think relates to the man from uncle uh, situation, because, yeah, where I grew up, uh, we didn't we didn't watch it. It uh, girl. Never saw a man from uncle. And one of the reasons uh, that I've always heard about TV uh, is that in syndication, hour longs do very poorly next huh. to half hours. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I guess that kind of makes sense. Like uh, when I was a kid, there was a lot of Mission Impossible on TV and stuff like that, but it was mostly half hours, Hogan's Heroes, Gilligan's Island, you know, uh, yeah. uh, stuff like that. So, yeah. Which it, is been weird a because so often they would show two half hour episodes back to back. Yeah. But, right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Although, I remember in the 80s in New York, they had a two-hour mash block that went yeah. from like like uh, on the, the what's now the Fox affiliate. It used yeah. to be like 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. And you would watch four mash episodes uh, uh, back to back, which was just bananas. I couldn't imagine watching a mash episode now. But <laughs> it's so funny because, yeah, there was a there was a period of time where it was all mash all the time. Yeah. When <laughs> when uh, the, the show I was on on FX, we debuted by advertising a um, what was it called? It was a it was a weekend of heroes and it was <laughs> Memorial Day weekend. And we were going to debut after, but it was a solid three day marathon of mash was our wow. lead in. Holy cow. <laughs> Is that 24 hours? Um, 
I think in those days they were 24 hours. Okay, yeah. so that's 72 times two. It's 140. Was that the whole series? Um, could be. It could be about wow. half of it because Nash ran for 11 years. Yeah. Wow. 11 years, that sounds right. <laughs> that's a big yeah, chunk so, of it to be certain. Yeah, 22 episodes a season back then. So, wow. <laughs> to get really TV nerd too, to go back to the uh, hour of syndicated show versus the half hours of syndicated show, th that would mean technically that the half hour sells more commercials than the hour yeah probably you know because so. you could talk to you know delco battery or you could talk to you know procter and gamble and you could say here's a half hour of mash how many times do you want to be on there oh twice all right well i'm going to show two two episodes back to back so you know that's four P and G wow. commercials per hour, <laughs> and then all the other commercials that are in there. Anyway, that's just TV nerd crap. Sorry about that. <laughs> Which is why we're here, John. Um, <laughs> let's let's watch this fight scene that Bill is in, playing quite the character. And uh, I'm I'm gonna just let you enjoy the pure, absolute seventies of this. It is so seventies. And uh, it's from Kung Fu. <laughs> and the, the redheaded guy in the, uh, you know, Steamboat Captain's uh, outfit, that's uh, that's our Bill. That's Bill. Wow. Our hero. <laughs> so let's take a look. Too much. Oh, and there's a raven. <laughs> now, the old man saying. The Why does King have a raven? Potentially. <laughs> Because why I, I think Bill's using no, the wrong finger there. Quiet, John Kane. We have an appointment in the kit. Quiet, John Kane. I would be foolish to do so. <laughs> he is. Yeah, he's the red bearded man. Well, Shannon, better be careful because he may kill Bill. <laughs> <laughs> Every once in a while on the screen, there's an Asian person, but not David Carradine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna throw a lantern at you. Oh, oh sorry, odd job. Yeah. <laughs> well, they look at they let a black guy be on screen, you know, to get his face kicked. Oh, oh, who'd that land in? <laughs> Very technical batting away of luggage. <laughs> Must be empty. I... <laughs> Ow. Francis is having his bath. Is that the same guy? Oh, wait for it. <laughs> oh. this, is, Bill. this is clearly the Warner Brothers studio, right? With the with the mountain in the back. Yeah. Uh yes, yes. This is up uh, up in the mountains. I, I think they called it the ranch. Yeah. Wow. That's a... Yeah, I know. Isn't that funny? There's no fight music. Yeah, yeah, it's really. By the way, it's I'd like, say it's that... not like watching a porn with no music, you know. <laughs> I'd say Carradine's kung fu moves are as good as mine. <laughs> <laughs> I do love, I do oh, love the catching on. of the fist that we would see that come back later in T.J. Hooker. Like, hey, I remember this time Dave Carradine got my fist. Why don't I do I, that to Leonard? Master I'm, Q. When I was I a kid, so there was no duller you. show than Kung Fu. <laughs> oh, crazy dog. Yeah, really boring. <laughs> Shatner what, directed what could have been, I mean, you imagine Shatner in the um, David Carradine role of Bill in the Tarantino movie? I think that would have been interesting. <laughs> Shatner directed some episodes of the 90s Kung Fu reboot. Oh, did he? So, yeah. Which I think David Carradine was also in. He was. He played like yeah. Kane's great grandson or something, as okay. I recall. Yeah. 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 And there was a younger guy, and uh Carradine's character is more magical in that yeah. one. I think <laughs> it's like Kung Fu, the journey continues or something. Uh, but I remember I didn't realize Bill was directing. Yeah. That's awesome. And they had to get ready for Star Trek Five. Oh, you know what? <laughs> this is this is uh, yeah. Good point. Very good point. Yes, actually, uh, <laughs> he is the guy who died in the closet. Unfortunately, right. yes. Yeah. Damn. He 
He was in Hong Kong, and the only thrill that could be had was in his own room. (laughs) (laughs) Nothing going on outside that a man could enjoy. Let me string myself up in the closet. (laughs) And this actor is still alive. He was... um, That's James Hong, correct? Yes, yeah. Love Hong. Caucasian, Caucasian boy, right? Yes. Well, okay. I mean, that was the thing. Um, Kwai Chang Kain was was Caucasian. He was uh, his parents died. I think he was oh, just with okay. his father, and his father died, so he was an orphan. He was a Caucasian orphan. Okay. Uh, <laughs> God, this is so tedious. Uh, okay, I'm going to uh, get us that. Well, hang on, hang on, hang on. What's going on here? What's going on? And can you steal the pebble from my hand? <laughs> You had rice in your pants. I remember, I remember as a kid on the school bus, you'd see kids with like a Kung Fu lunchbox. And even then I'm like, you can get through an episode of that. <laughs> <laughs> I've got my Planet of the Apes lunchbox in the back to show you. Um, hey. Uh, yeah. The, all the stuff I was into. That I was- like shit. I like shows that got canceled after eight episodes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. they, it, they were made into some really especially bad movies. Yes. <laughs> Let's Make just glue movie. these together. Make a TV movie. <laughs> oh, God. Is this the same actor you saw him with at the beginning of the show tonight? Oh, no. No. But, <laughs> oh, okay. But that would be lovely. Okay. <laughs> this isn't part of the Suzy Wong universe. <laughs> oh. <okay. laughs> That's not canon. That's not Suzy Wong canon. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now that is a terrible rumor. How dare you start that, Stevie? I did not have a manimal lunchbox. I never had a lunchbox because what? my parents said, Why would we buy you an empty box? A paper bag is good enough. Wow. Aww. And Holy I was God. literally a brown bagger. <laughs> I okay. had a peanuts one. I had my Planet of the Apes one, which is in the back. Um nice. Uh, oh, really? I, You've got your original. No, I, I, a friend gifted me um, w- w- one a couple of years ago, but it has the, it has the thermos in it, which isn't uh, all that easy to find. That's oh. true. Mm-hmm. That makes it a very worthy gift. <laughs> all right. Let me... Uh, let This is, without a doubt, one of my favorite things that Bill Shatner ever did. It is one joke, <laughs> but it is one of my all-time favorite favorite jokes <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure i got the volume up on this all right here we go this is william shatner from airplane 2 a very underrated movie okay not as good as the original i would say but still stands on its own let's see if it makes you laugh <laughs> don't know that actor's name but i believe he was from uh, operation petticoat the tv scene Richard Gilliland. Ooh, maybe. Damn. He was in a <laughs> lot of stuff for two years. <laughs> Stevie, it's the quickening <laughs> of everything. <laughs> Damn. What is it with them? Sir, the Mayflower's in trouble. She's coming in hotter than a firecracker, sir. Their computer's down, they've lost their crew, and they're flying on manual control, sir. We better get to the tower, then. We have no tower, sir. No tower. Just a bridge, sir. Why the hell aren't I notified about these things? <laughs> Here it is. <laughs> I love that. Too. We could try ignoring it, sir. I see. Pretend nothing has happened and hope everything turns out all right in the morning. Just a thought, sir. I've considered that. There's got to be a better angle. <laughs> in the doors. <laughs> they lost their crew and our manual. Who's in control of that bucket, Lieutenant? Some guy by the name of Ted Stryker, sir. No. We're going to do that. Never heard of him. That's not exactly true. We were like... We were close. We were close. Until... Until, sir? Until that day over Macho Grande. (laughs) Over Macho... (laughs) Never over Macho Grande. (sighs) Wasn't a pretty picture. Let's go. Right, sir. All right, I'll let it go a little. Oh, <laughs> All 
I found is that these red lights keep moving back and forth. Aside from that, this thing seems to have no other functions whatsoever. I think this came directly from the Enterprise. I don't put all that money to a thing with red lights that keep going back and forth. Doesn't that use keyboard? Sir, these lights keep blinking out of sequence, sir. Yeah, this is these all references to the Enterprise. <laughs> I'm curious if Shatner got these references. <laughs> he, he, he's, uh, from what I gather, he's not a guy who really dove into the, the 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 mythos behind Star Trek. It was very much a, what are my lines? I'm going to deliver them. You know, <laughs> so, right? Right. I've, ne- I, I've, I've never seen yeah. Airplane Two. That, that's the most I've ever seen of Airplane Two. He comes in very late. Okay. Uh very very late in the movie. And the uh <laughs> the the really that one moment of uh no tower, and then he opens the door. <laughs> they actually replay it during the credits. <laughs> it's such a good bit, and people loved it so much. And honestly, I remember because I loved Airplane One. Oh my god, one of my favorite comedies ever. And when I saw this, I was you know nothing but disappointed. But over the years, and this happens with a lot of things that shatters mm-hmm. in for me. Over the years, I developed this fondness that just goes you know so far. I actually feel that way about um, uh, Star Trek Five. Mm-hmm. Okay, um, un- undiscovered country is that that'll be the final frontier. Final, the front- final frontier. Okay, and Shatner yeah. directed that one. Yes, exactly. Okay, all right. Yeah, exactly. And we're we're you know we're, I I I very, uh, very long mountain climbing sequence at the beginning, right? <laughs> yes. Okay, so, like so really many. long and falling <laughs> yeah. and falling and and there's there's so many things in that movie that are considered bad. But if you look at them through the lens of this is when Shatner finally gets some control of this franchise just mm-hmm. for one movie. Yeah. And what does he do? He creates all these subplots for each of the crew members. He creates a romance between Uhura and Scotty. Mm-hmm. Um, he creates a um, very badass job that Sulu is doing. Sulu's yeah. a, I think he's a captain at this point. Yeah. And uh and you know, I always see Star Trek Five as him going, I'm really sorry. I've been such a dick for 20 years, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Here, let me make it up to you. And there's some great casting in that movie. I mean, that to me is just one of those, you know, it really deserves a second look. It's a fine movie. Well, David Warner was was a highlight yeah. of it, and of course they brought him back yeah. for six. Yes, yes. As and David Klingon Warner. Chancellor. Yeah, David Warner is a great Trek actor too. I mean, he's a great actor, period. As a different character, though, right? Or yes, he, he was like an Earth character. Ambassador in five and Klingon Chancellor in six. And right. then on TNG, he's torturing Picard in an episode, right? Yes, he he's is. A, he's, he's a Cardassian okay. torturing Picard, yes. That's right. Which was Picard, yes. Very notable uh, two parter. <laughs> And wow. this is after him being the big bad in Tron and being the big yeah. bad in Time Bandits. And maybe one of the greatest voices any actor's ever had, too. Like, just just oh. so distinctive. and oh, uh, sure. Yeah. Well, well, I mean, I, I became a fan of David Warner clear back at the time. Nicholas Meyer, who directed Star Trek's 2 and 6. Oh. Oh, wow. Yeah, Nicholas Meyer's oh, that's fantastic. right. That's right. So, all right, moving on. Uh, we have, let me get, let me get the next clip lined up up okay so we're just gonna skip through this one uh it is i think notable on so many levels uh let me uh introduce everybody to chris (laughs) how familiar are you with barbary coast i know a little bit about i remember when it was on and he's a detective in gold rush era san francisco who wears disguises is that yes it's a yes. little it's a little like wild 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 west yeah, a little bit kind of a watered down version <laughs> okay all right and he's got a partner i don't recall who played his partner well john weber um, obviously <laughs> <laughs> but he was the quirkier part of the duo right um, yeah but uh, his partner was doug mcclure oh, oh okay all right <laughs> yeah the the um 
Yeah, the basic uh, setup behind it is Doug McClure is friends with the character played by Shatner, but Shatner is pretty much Artemis Gordon. Okay, all right. And and Shatner's a very serious government agent. And Barbary Coast, uh, and I believe this is historically true, and Chris, you've actually written a history book, at least one that I know, uh, that Barbary Coast was a lawless part of San Francisco. Yeah, and yeah. just very big on because it was a port town. It was just very big on getting sailors to uh, get drunk, get robbed, and then get back on their ships and get yeah. the hell out. <laughs> and so there was a very active business in San Francisco of drugging, clubbing, kidnapping, um, you know, press gang. Like you could go into a bar and then wake up the next day working on a ship. Oh, God. Like, and it, it, this show didn't make it a season, right? Or it was it just not. okay? Maybe All thirteen right. episodes. Okay, <laughs> I, I think so. It's very San Fran. Um, the only difference is there's fewer places to park now. <laughs> but I love how high concept it is, and um, and I will just tell you. <laughs> Wait, they just gave you jobs? Well. <laughs> That's like a South Beach coat party. Not that Joshua would know. Um, <laughs> so Joshua. the, uh, yeah, I, I was interviewing uh, William Shatner. He did not want to talk about Star Trek. I looked at the list of questions that my producers gave me, and it was 100 questions about Star Trek. <laughs> <laughs> Almost all of them insulting. Oh. Very stuttering John, the way they set me up. Oh, God. And he wouldn't talk about Trek. He's like, nope. Not talking about it. Ask me something else. And so I tried to remember everything I'd ever seen with Shatner in it. And as you can tell from this show, I collect a lot of garbagey trivia in my head. So I asked him about Barbary Coast because when I was a kid, I was excited to watch a show that Shatner was on. So I watched as much of it as I could. And I asked him when you were doing Barbary Coast. How long would you have to sit in the makeup chair to get these disguises? And he was like, oh, oh, hours, <laughs> hours. No one's ever asked me that. I had to, oh, I had to make molds for my face. I had to change the shape of my face to play different characters. Oh, it was terrible. I had to get in earlier than everybody. I, I had to go home. I was already exhausted from shooting all day. And I was so excited that I asked him something that, you know, he could answer and that he was excited <laughs> to answer. And then I, I'm so proud of myself. I followed it up with, so when you're on Star Trek and you're, work, you're looking at Leonard Nimoy, where they're carefully painting his eyebrows and they're mm. carefully gluing on his ear tips. And, you know, he's out of commission for like an hour doing that. And all you had to do is pull on a jersey. <laughs> and he's like oh yes no good point it's like leonard got his his revenge on me <laughs> i used to feel bad for everybody on star trek who had to get all the the hair and makeup and now i finally get my another tv show and it's just you know half my day is being turned into some old prospector for one scene <laughs> At uh, our old friend Bill, as he is on Barbary Coast, and it is high concept. One of the things that I find so funny about it is Doug McClure is so bad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Doug hey, Ryan McClure. Ryan here. Sorry. Your wireless. Ignore it. Oh, once again, oh, raised me. <laughs> my, my, my mother and father watched Merv Griffin every night when I was a kid. Yeah. And when I remember Doug McClure, whenever he was on, both my parents saying he's drunk. He's drunk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> really, used to be on quite a few talk shows drunk. Doug McClure. I know him, and you may know him from like the land that time forgot. Yep. Oh, yes. the people that time forgot. Mm -hmm. Um, he was apparently in the Virginian. Yeah. Which is a very big deal uh uh Western TV Western. Um, uh, I I've never seen an, a minute of it. I don't know anything about it. You, it was a a rare ninety minute episode series. Wow! Oh, no kidding. So it was like later, of course, edited it down to an hour for syndication. But yeah, originally ninety minutes every week. Yeah. 
very popular. It seems that Doug McClure was really beloved, which is hilarious because he is <laughs> not good. Um, and I don't know why I love this, but this is the, okay, WCBB TV in Boston, Channel 5. I watched, this was our Channel 5 when I was a little kid because we grew up north of Boston. Uh, so somebody had taped it directly off. Oh, let me turn on the sound here. <laughs> I think it was an ABC show, if I remember right. Uh, that's how I remember right. it as well. Okay, yeah. yeah. And uh, apparently the stuntmen uh, union really did a lot of the work. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's me. As, as Jeff Cable. Cable. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the many looks of Bill. And so, there's Doug McClure. So was this Kung Fu character in disguise as well? <laughs> I, mean, I wouldn't be surprised if some <laughs> producer didn't look at that and go, we should make Bill do that every week. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I hate Bill. Let's, let's do this to him. And I think this might be the first episode. I think this is the pilot. Pat Hingle. Oh. Pat Hingle. Later, later some, Commissioner Gordon in the yes. Gordon Batman yes. movies. Got some colorful character names here. <laughs> and of course, uh, William Shatner as Ugg Thor, <laughs> Old West Caveman. I was a Federation werewolf. <laughs> Let's all take our time. Back to cut <laughs> over here. This is what a half hour script stretched out to an hour looks like. Yeah. Uh, reaction. Whatever well, they put all that makeup on Bill, they didn't have any time to shoot the show. <laughs> back to scene, back to him. <laughs> oh. oh, it's Pat Engel. <laughs> That's an interesting voice. <laughs> was, that, was that a missed encounter? <laughs> oh my god. I almost attacked my boss. <laughs> I do love the, you know, very 70s like yeah. Duncan Duncan music. <laughs> 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 oh my god god we have to see him walk up the stairs <laughs> this is like Jeez. plan nine from outer space <laughs> we have to watch every car being parked Jeez, yeah. Dola, you and Hatch, you got one minute to get yourself set he walked up the stairs the over there <laughs> then got to the top up there but we're down here Feast your eyes, Mr. Smollett. That guy. And I defy anyone to tell it from the real thing. If it's so good, why are you selling it at a discount? Why don't you pass it yourself? <laughs> He's you doing character work. <laughs> if you don't want it, just say so. I sold 20 times that much tonight. He'll take this lot, too. Anybody I know? Just one of the richest men in the city. And getting richer, thanks to me. All right, Pike. Here you are. Pike. They're not the pie kind, dude. <laughs> nope. Oh, somebody's got to jump. Okay. So not only did and Bill have to sit up in the makeup chair, but his double did too. <laughs> What's a London body doing in the yeah, but... <laughs> oh, oh. I, wish, I wish I'd called it. I was like, with all that mud, somebody's got to be falling in it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Doctor Who reference in the chat. <laughs> And of course, the whimsical banjo. Yeah. Partner? You mean Pike? Not smart to shoot at government men, makes them hostile. 
Pike's dead. Well, I wager you'll live long enough to stand trial, though. Speaking of wagers. That is a bizarre disguise he's got. <laughs> well, I, bet I know your favorite yeah. color. Reminds me of Chaka from Land of the Lost. <laughs> yeah. He's like, ah, oh, sa. <laughs> it's like, like girly Dr. Zayas. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Zayas 1.0. <laughs> Oh my god, we could watch this forever. Well, if you guys don't mind, I'm gonna skip us ahead. Oh, <laughs> I mean, we we're definitely getting the gist. <laughs> oh, here we go. Oh, can can time. Two hundred thousand dollars in funny money. Doug McClure, you're telling me that guy's a drinker? I don't believe it for a minute. <laughs> I'm the only man that could tell me where it is conveniently silenced by the government. Three months I worked to set up that buy. There must have been a clash of egos on, on this show with these two. Oh, oh, and the man who has it. Doesn't it give you the creeps never knowing who you are from one day to the next? <laughs> Uh, now, subtext clearly isn't Doug McClure's uh, job here. <laughs> uh, but we're going to go into some heavy exposition of what this entire series is about. And I think you'll see why it didn't even make a full season. Well, it's about ruffles. I always know. <laughs> well, I don't. It makes my skin crawl. Uh, uh, Cash. What? I get this at the 70s no, tuxedo rental place. No way. <laughs> this ruffled shirt. What do you mean? I said, no way, Jeff. You are the governor's personal undercover agent. I am just a saloon owner. A saloon owner. And a crook. <laughs> Even though I've sworn to pull the law, I am not a crook. Why do you keep telling me I'm a crook? I always believed that we were friends. And I believed in the tooth fairy, but I grew up. Jeez. He's hammered. Cash. <laughs> uh, no way. Okay. Wait, he's on the saloon. I was, was going to say, okay. Thanks. I mean, just because I hold a marker of yours. Yeah, yeah come on, Jeff. No, I mean it. <laughs> you save a man's life. You can't expect him to feel grateful to you for the rest of his There's day. Always got to get that shirt off, off somewhere, yeah. doesn't he? I'll see <laughs> so you manage to get your shirt off. Yes, I do know. I want well, you to if you're going to change, I'm going to leave. The pressure you. <laughs> I can use me, man. You're pressuring me. I am. What? Me? Pressuring Doug McClure. I shouldn't do that. All right, all right. Just this once, then quits. <laughs> and we're all even up. Maybe he's right, though. This is about as well lit as Picard well, season three. Yeah. <laughs> well, what do you got in mind? Step number one. I love how Doug McClure is like a more drunk Ryan O'Neill. <laughs> Pretty drunk. Kill him who did. The tooth fairy? Come on, Jeff. I don't understand. Yeah, it's what like ba Barry Lyndon lighting that we're doing over there. <laughs> <laughs> Bill's pissed you only see half his face. Um, so, I don't know. This is some part of the story. I do love that there's all that mud. That seems historically correct. Mm -hmm. And ladies and gentlemen... Mr. Richard Keel. <laughs> no way. But, am I really? saying that name correctly? I are believe so. It is. Wow. I got to go to my James Bond set. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Some James Bond script. They said I'd be good in it. Call me Jaws. Not to be confused with the shark, of course. I don't know if he would have been Jaws if this show had gotten renewed. So, you know, we're probably better off that uh, it got canceled. But both uh, well, we did Twilight... get two Bond movies out of it. So, Twilight Zone veterans, both. Oh my gosh. I'm sorry. That's right. <laughs> to serve man. I just want to know who made those pants. <laughs> I think I'm the same thing. <laughs> and that best on the honest buddy. That is quite the vest. <laughs> sure looks like it, don't it? <laughs> we could have had to get that cranium. I also love the um, 
the haircuts. They're a little more 1975 yeah. than they yeah. are anything else. <laughs> Zoom. Not quite 1875, 1975. I understand you arranged for that funeral. Arranged and paid for. I also understand that the deceased owed you money. That's what I always needed. It's kind of like when they gave up having period accurate haircuts on happy days after a while. Yes. <laughs> Known as the potsy rule. <laughs> Although, as my wife always likes to point out, or uh, later seasons of Loretta Swit on MASH. Yeah. Yes. When her hat, uh, her hair got very not of the period. Pardon me, are you gentlemen dealers at the Orleans Casino in Vegas? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know that there's anything more here, although <laughs> I might dig up might dig up an old commercial for you. I, I, I do want <laughs> to... There's a great writer named Brian Scully who wrote on Family Guy, and he wrote on The Simpsons as well. And uh, he has a lot of great stories about showbiz people he's met over the years, and yeah. Before he became a writer, he was working in Montgomery Ward's appliance uh, department in Glendale. And he would always tell me about all the aging film noir characters he would sell appliances to. Oh my but God. Um, I was talking to him about the riots in the early 90s in L.A. And he was like, well, you know, I just walked to the front of my house with my shotgun in my hand. And I, you know, j just shoot people away. <laughs> like, I was like, you had a shotgun? He's like, yeah, you know, Doug McClure gave it to me. <laughs> oh my goodness! Because <laughs> I, I guess he wrote on whatever sitcom that was that Doug McClure was on in the late '80s about an alien child or something oh called Out of This World or something, where, where he played a father. And uh, I think it was like one of those one sitcom, a uh, one season sitcoms that was on like Channel Nine in New York. Like it wasn't Small Wonder, but it was kind of in that universe. And uh, yeah, yeah, but yeah, I, I guess uh, Doug McClure gifted him with a shotgun. <laughs> <laughs> now, is it just me, or if some famous actor in Hollywood gifts you a gun, what is the likelihood that's a murder weapon? <laughs> <laughs> well, what I did like is I was in an entire room full of like 10 or 12 writers, and he told this story, and I was the only guy there who knew who Doug McClure was. Oh, so. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's amazing. He sort of receded into the he's receded into the collective memory of television. <laughs> <laughs> so Stevie is making sure that we know that uh out of this world lasted for four whole seasons. Wow. That uh thank you, Amoral Crackpot. <laughs> 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 okay um this is we're we're running long so uh thank you for staying with us if you're staying with us but we have got to get through uh two more of these things because honestly i really i want to see everyone's reaction to this um back to the 1970s a little show from 1977 and hang on I'm, i gotta get past this commercial <laughs> oh, I'm going to figure this thing out. I got the ad blocker and they've been punishing me for having the ad blocker ever since. But we, we I, haven't been shut down at all here, have we? We haven't. And and I, I have to brag. Um, it's because yes. we started a new show on another channel oh, and it's okay. called Crash Test. And I'm basically um, doing all the clips that we'll do on our show uh -huh. as a as a show. And uh, it's uh, it's just running these clips before they're going to appear on the show, ah, but crafty. to see which ones we get in trouble for. <laughs> and so and far, so it's been proof, as far as I know, right, John? It's gone. It's gone extremely well so yeah, far. Okay. It's how I found out that we couldn't show any clips from Columbo. From Columbo. Right. Okay. That's that's where I got in trouble, and I never would have known it was going to happen if I hadn't done that other show. So if you ever want to. Go, um, I don't think it's on Weber Internet thingy. Uh, no, no, it is on the Facebook page. It's on Weber Internet thingy. Um, if you ever find a crash test going on, I will be there doing uh, pop-up video balloons. Okay. All right. <laughs> and uh, I'm still looking for the puppet or uh, action figure that's going to be the host of that show. I haven't done anything. <laughs> I love it. But, uh, okay, here we go. We're going to take a look. At one of the most interesting, terrible game shows in oh. the history of American television. 
And that would be Tattletales. Yeah, oh, not the price is right, Tattletales. <laughs> now, this episode of Tattletales. If you don't know what Tattletales is, it's couples basically do uh, newlywed game kind of questions. Would your wife say this or would your husband say that? Yeah. And they use celebrity couples. Bert Convy, of course. Bert Convy. Very, mm -hmm. very congenial, excellent host. Former and professional I, baseball player in the early 50s. No. Bert Convy, yeah. You're kidding me. Yeah, it was a real deal. I think he, I, I won't pretend to get the team right, but I, I think he played for a season or two. That's incredible. Yeah. I've always loved his sense. Oh, uh, yes. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for coming to see us here at the studio. Thank you for tuning us in at home. Oh, you're going to have a good time today. We have a rookie couple, someone you've never seen on Tattle Tales before. You've seen him a lot, though, and you're going to know who he is. And two other couples that you have definitely seen oh, on Tattle Tales before, and they're back because they, they're so much fun here. Here they are. What do you mind for the blue section today? The star of The Price is Right, Mr. Bob Barker and his wife, Dorothy Jones. <laughs> <laughs> now, which one of them is spayed or neutered? William Shatner and his wife, Marcy Lafferty. Marcy Lafferty is so beautiful. <laughs> That's it's just my, 70s me to today. For the red section, he's the rookie, Mr. Pat Cooper and his Pat wife. Cooper. Pat Cooper. Pat <laughs> Cooper. What a lineup. Wow. Holy cow. Now, yeah, I have to just. Is their divorce, but, uh, Shatner's? <laughs> <laughs> I, d I don't believe uh, well i think the men on either end died without those wives and uh, uh shatner moved on from that wife uh, two more times so. yeah yeah <laughs> now um chris did you ever have that incredible new york experience of working on something and also working on it was pat cooper I I never I never worked with Pat Cooper anywhere. Like I know he was a guy you would see around all the time, not yeah. as much as Tony Randall, but you you would see uh, Pat Cooper. Uh, but our friend, our mutual friend Chris DeLuca has a great Pat Cooper story that's very very short, and I'll I'll tell it. But oh, yeah. Yeah. he saw Pat Cooper waiting for a bus, and you know DeLuca was a struggling stand up comic, and he went up to him and he said, "Hey, Mr. Cooper, blah blah blah," you know they. Two outer boroughs Italian guys talking. It's yeah. like, hey, I'm a stand up comic. Do you have any advice? And the bus pulled up, and Pat Cooper said, Yeah, two things. Number one, work is work. And number two, don't be Robert Wall. And he got on the bus and took off. <laughs> and Luca has no idea what the don't be Robert Wall part of, part of the advice was. But, but I, I know DeLuca, DeLuca's followed it all these years, you know. <laughs> yeah, I haven't seen him be one Robert Wool once. <laughs> but um, like Pat, Pat Cooper was at war at war with everybody in showbiz. But I guess at that morning, Robert Wool had had done something to him that had uh, uh, bent his nose out of joint. <laughs> I had a callback for Arliss, and he was a dick. <laughs> and by the way, what's my story with Robert Wool? I had a callback for Arliss, and he was a dick. <laughs> Oh, no. Oh. <laughs> it was so funny because his, I was a fan. I was such a Robert Wool fan. Oh. And his dog's name was Gracie. And I saw him uh, do an interview with Alan Havey okay. uh, on uh, Comedy uh, Channel. Uh, yeah. Before it was Comedy Central. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when I went in to read for him, uh, the director was there. And the director was Melanie Mayron. Okay, from thirty something. From thirty something. Yeah, and uh, and just lovely, just absolutely mm -hmm. lovely. Uh, uh, she was fantastic, and I accidentally bumped into the dog's dish of water that was okay. on the floor, which was put in a very stupid place, and I apologized, and I apologized to the dog, and Wool goes, <laughs> "You know my dog's name." And I said, yeah, I mean, I saw you holding her on your lap when you were on an interview. And he's like, just read the the lines, for God's sake. And oh. Melanie Ray Mayron's like, yeah, we're, we're kind of behind. So we're just going to go a little quick on this, if that's okay. Oh, John. my like, God. Yeah, of course oh, no. no. <laughs> and before I was done with the scene, like there was like one last line in the scene. Will goes, fine, I'm good. Oh. And cuts me off, and Melanie Rayron gets out of her seat and comes and knocks into the dog's dish, and comes <laughs> over to me. And she goes, "You did really great. Thank you so much." And I'm like, oh. "That's an actor. Oh, God. that's someone who understands what people are going through when they come in here." 
to be treated like this by Robert Wool. I could have gone off on him for five minutes. (laughs) Hey, new bomb Kirk. Your your shit is awful. No, you've never been him, and that's uh that's important. So oh man. Anyway, never be Robert. (laughs) Um, I don't know how much of this we can uh is Shatner cover. wearing a pink uh, leotard? For our audience to warm up. You can oh, see I can that. see that. Yeah. So Have a look. Kind of dull and slow. That's, isn't that a, we got that some wide collars, that's for sure. Uh, yeah. Let me just remind you guys before we say anything else. I will say, I think Pat started looking younger than this. The yeah. They are answering the question the best they know how. Honestly, He's doing like his version of streaks and tips. Is to figure out how they're going to answer it. If they try to figure out how you're going to answer it, you'll be Bill. Also, you know, uh, yeah, just give me the pink uh, sweatshirt. First things first. The next thing is the Price is Right has a new time period, That's and right. we should remind them about it. Well, be my pleasure. We're on at 10 o'clock in the East, 10 to 11 in the East now, and 9 to 10 in the West. Right. And uh, not only that match game, which was so popular in the afternoon, is now in the morning immediately after our show. What's so up? at, at uh, 11 o'clock in the east and 10 in the west. Right. Uh, so if you watch at 11 o'clock in the east and at 10 o'clock in the west, riveting television. You still see Gene what, and Brett what, about, what about people in the Midwest? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we got Chicago viewers, Bob. What about them? <laughs> uh, well, I, this is crazy that Barker's like the big star. Yeah. <laughs> What's so, at uh, uh, 11 o'clock in the east and 10 in the west. Right. So really if you watch at 11 o'clock oh, God, in the I east went back and at 10 o'clock in the west, yeah. you can still see Gene and Brett Summers fighting on match. Yes, yeah, right. If you yeah. folks yeah. need your fanny yeah. flag fix it's on Mountain Time, you'll need to uh, <laughs> That's right. The picture is not good, but it's on radio. Okay? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. So Bill, Bill makes a joke about um, about the show being on radio anyway. Uh, <laughs> that that rascal Bill Shatner. Uh, just gonna jump Let's in. hit the ground I've running with the scheduling block. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean that right there is like daytime television. Right yeah. there, having yeah. worked in it myself, it's like there's somebody in somebody's ear, uh, pro- probably Bert's, like. No, no, go over the time change. Yeah. No, the network <laughs> said you have to give time for the time change. And by the way, you can see in the upper corner of the, of this screen that this is on the game show network. So this happened years ago. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> when this aired on game show network, it probably was 20 years old. Holy cow. <laughs> yeah, that's when I was working on game show network. Yeah, I worked on game show network. Too. Yeah. Well, yeah. Drew Paris probably doing morning. Bob's job by then. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we we know all there is to know about your sleeping habits, Dorothy Joe. You'd be pleased to know that. <laughs> I'm sorry about that, Bill. Uh, what more has you say? Well, uh, I'm away uh, a fair amount of the time, and uh, we have these. The question is: Does your wife sleep better when you're home or when okay. you're away? Okay. Large Dobermans uh, roaming the property. We breed Dobermans and have a number of them, and they kind of take care of the property. Uh, and uh, mark their spots where they went. Yes. And, and a couple of them uh, even sleep with Marcy when I'm not there. Uh-huh. She dusts them too. Yes. <laughs> uh, but no, but the dog does not take my place. I must assure you. Oh, I'm glad. And, and there, <laughs> that'd be pretty sick. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, she does not sleep as well. Not as well. I don't think. No, it's, I didn't it's, either. Uh, it's uh, <laughs> it's very hard to sleep when your partner's doing this all. Oh, that's that's Marcy. You should see the dog. I told you, Bert's yeah, funny. Did that very well. I'd ask Marcy about Bert Con. Yeah, I don't know. Very Corbin says it's like Battle of the Network Rugs. Corbin, I've always said that uh, Marcy will sleep um, not as well, worse than usual. Here she comes. Uh, uh, Marcy, when Bill is uh, uh, not away. Uh, do you sleep at night better than usual, worse than usual, or the same as usual? The only members of our family who sleep better when he's away are our dogs. No, I do not sleep as well at That's all. That's correct. He said yes, and you're wrong. What else is he going to say? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> The reason they sleep better is because they get to sleep with me. Yeah, they right. really love that. I can understand <laughs> that. Then, hey, Marcy, Marcy, bow wow. Never mind, never mind. That's the most oh, Pat yes, 
stupid <laughs> thing in the world. Thank me for a walk. I need to pee over here. Whoa! The zombie and pantyhose. She very rarely sleeps, my wife. But when I'm gone, I gotta say, whatever sleep she does have or do is worse when I'm not at home. It's worse. Yes. Yeah. You're away a lot. I mean, you're playing in golf. We don't have to watch this. I want to watch it. My second family in New York, they're getting crazy too. Oh, she finds out wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just get the answer from Pat's wife, and then I can move on. They are on next week. What do you mean you're oh, gonna have my <laughs> Sorry. Okay, you'll say it worse. Here she comes. Patty, uh, when Pat is away, uh, do you sleep at night better than usual, worse than usual, or the same as usual? Well, I hope you got this right now. I would say the same. No, he said. Uh, oh, oh, that's very interesting. Same. I would say the worst. Was that even I a choice? Sleeper, anyway. Yeah. So I sleep. Bad same. when he's there, and I sleep bad when he's not there. I see. That, I, uh, I didn't think he, he always there, tells right. me, he says, boy, I can't wait to go home so I can get some good sleep. Yeah. And I sleep terrible when you're awake. Now she's saying something else. Mm. Oh, that's wise. No. <laughs> you see, that's rookie's luck. I mean, it can go either way. You can, oh, you mean this is, this is on now? This is the air. Oh, I thought this was the rehearsal. No, no, this is it. This is, this is the real thing here. Okay. And you blew the first one. Yes, I, I did. No, do you think Pat literally thought this was the rehearsal? <laughs> Because it's, it's possible, it's possible, yeah. <laughs> wow, it was I, the first time that uh, that he was ever on the show, so maybe he wouldn't know. And also, I guess Pat went into the barber and said, "Could you leave it long on the sides?" <laughs> Which is a very <laughs> weird, weird request to make. I, you know, I see it and I go, "Let me get another picture of Pat." Uh, there's Pat. I see it and I think he was like, "I was hanging out with Paul Williams this." This Saturday, Saturday. and i thought you know it's got nice hair that paul williams well wow. so 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 um uh, marcy and shatner are the only ones on the board yes wow i would expect no less from bill and his, and his wifey you They're know i i saw an episode of this on buzzer a couple of years ago where it was orson bean and his wife and yes. I, I believe the actor james darren and his wife and the center was robert blake and his then wife N not the one who he oh. Who he who he offed, but another yeah. wife, and Robert Blake was such a gentleman. Oh. Like there were all these appallingly misogynistic questions, and uh, Orson Bean in particular was a monster. But one of the questions was, "Would your husband sleep with an ugly woman?" You know, and and Orson Bean's wife's like, "Definitely not." And he was like, "Oh, of course not. Why would I?" Blah, blah, blah. And they got to Robert Blake, and he just paused, and he had the the headphones on. He's like, "I've never met an ugly woman." And you could see the audience was totally baffled by this very sensitive display by this guy who would later then um, murder a woman. <laughs> or a you don't even have to say allegedly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it was incredible. He was such a gentleman throughout. And, um, you know, I, I, and I think he split up with that woman eventually the proper way. But um, it, it, it was it was uh, it was something to see. How many spouses survived at this point is the question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know a lot of uh, marriages that survived tattletales, but yeah. that was just that was just the times. <laughs> just where it was. Let's take one last peek because uh we did tease it ahead of time and uh it is epic. <laughs> wow. Another of the great um William Shatner holding a torch uh movie. <laughs> That would be Kingdom of the Spiders. Uh, this is this is why I think Kingdom of the Spiders is kind of gold. And I wonder if you ever discussed it with Bill, Chris, which was, I remember him doing, uh, it looked like, in my memory, it was a TV commercial for, I think, one of the early DVRs. Okay. okay. It might have been from Phillips. And the movie that he's watching uh, on it is Kingdom of the Spiders. And they show some kind of wacky, you know, unbelievable bad movie scenes from wow. it. Um, but do, does he ever talk about Kingdom of the Spiders that you know? We... <laughs> a little bit of a detour in the storytelling here. Um, yeah, yeah. We never discussed it in the writing of the book, but a couple of weeks after he and I wrote the book, um, I got a message from Shatner on my answering machine saying... Chris, Bill Shatner here. I've read the screenplay, and I'm, I'm, I think it needs some work. Uh, call me. I hung up, and then I called him back, and I got his assistant, and she was like, "Yeah, Bill, want to talk to you about your screenplay?" 
And I told Kathleen, I haven't sent Bill a screenplay. She's like, oh, okay, well, I'll follow up on that. And then I later got an answering machine yeah. message from, hi, Chris, Bill Shatner again. I really want to talk about the screenplay you've written. I, we, I, I mean, <laughs> I, we really need to make some changes before we go further. So um, I eventually went to his office. I was unemployed. And apparently there's a British writer named Chris Regan oh. who is not in the WGA, the Writers Guild oh. of, of America. So he is squatting on my name in Europe or <laughs> otherwise. <laughs> and this writer named Chris Regan had written a sequel to Kingdom of the Spiders. Oh, my God. <laughs> that some producers had brought to Shatner about maybe directing and starring in. Oh, wow. And um, so I came by and I'm like, yeah, I, um, yeah, I, I didn't work on this screenplay. And he's like, well, why don't you rewrite it? So... <laughs> so <laughs> So very briefly, I was on a project that would have been screenplay screenplay by Chris Regan based on the story by Chris Regan, who wouldn't have been me. But um, it same wound exact up, spelling. Yeah, uh, yes, yeah, same exact spelling. And he yeah. has an IMDb page, and he does some kind of genre horror pictures. I've never seen any of his work, but occasionally on my IMDb page, you'll see a poster for Paintball Massacre, which is one of the films he's produced in England. And, you know, uh, God bless him. I have nothing against the guy we work oh, in. Boy. We're both very different writers. Yeah, yeah. But um, the producers of it were just a couple of con women, and I don't care if they see this. We, we, <laughs> we, we wound up yelling at each other in a Chinese restaurant on Beverwill. Um, <laughs> because, but... Um, they wanted me to come up with a new idea and Shatner had some ideas um, where he wanted to work in kind of oil, uh, big business contamination to, you know, like uh, make these spiders crazy again, et cetera, et cetera. And um, these producers wanted me to write, write, write and not pay me. And yeah. Uh, yeah. eventually I told Shatner that um, uh, like, yeah, I've, I've written this outline and they won't, be straight with me about the payment. He's like, okay, well, we'll, we'll, we'll talk to them in the office. And um, he had them come by the office and all my interactions with Bill were terrific. We yeah. were really professional, nice. And, you know, I'd, I'd heard stories about him. He was a little prickly and these women came in here and he just turned to them and said, when is this man getting paid? <laughs> I, just... I love it. And one of the women was like, well, we're on track. On track. Get the train in the station. This man does not work for free. I love <laughs> he, it. He totally exploded at them. And it was it was so so wonderful to see an actor stand up for a writer like that. Yeah. And um yeah. And then I had lunch with these two producers and the woman was saying, you have no credits at all, blah, blah, blah. We're not going to give you, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and uh, she's, she's an, she was a Northern Irish woman. Um, and at one point she said, well, I'm sorry if you don't like what I'm saying. I'm British. We tell it like it is, <laughs> which isn't what the British are known for. And then I, and I said, and I pointed that out and I said, and anyway, you're Irish. And then she blew her stack at that. She was very clearly a Northern Irish Protestant. And, and it was something where I, <laughs> this is the only time this ever happened. I'm like, okay, you guys are picking up lunch. Goodbye. And I just walked out uh -huh. there. <laughs> and, 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 and I, I told Shatner, about it. I was like, yeah, I have, I have a bad feeling about this too. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. so I, I, I wrote a very long outline for, for a sequel to this film that Shatner was going to direct. And it was one of those things where, because I think the original takes place in Arizona, and our yeah. sequel is going to take place in Arizona. At one point, the producers called me and said, by the way, we want to do it in Louisiana. Because <laughs> it was, it was post-Katrina and there were tax breaks. I'm like, well, it's kind of a different vibe. From Arizona, certainly is are these spiders going to be in a swamp or in a bayou? <laughs> but but but, 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 yeah, but we didn't really talk about it for, uh, about the for the book. But yeah, he and I had a Kingdom of the Spiders related adventure um, after that. Wild! Oh my god! I wow! That's wow! Sometimes yeah. the stars align. <laughs> it was just very, very nutty. And the fact that there was another Chris Regan who had written a draft and he wanted it thrown out and his Chris Regan was going to rewrite his draft and there was going to be an environmental message. <laughs> <laughs> which, which to me is like a weird Steven Seagal kind of a thing. Like, yeah, yeah, I've done a bunch of things now. I want to start putting environmental messages into my movies. Yeah. Okay. Now, now, Chris, can you recall and, and can you share for that matter? 
how the Bill Shatner character, who was basically trapped, you know, within all the spider webs all over the town in the original, how did he escape that to star in a sequel? Well, you know, Joe, we decided to ignore that. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> the old Hollywood tradition. <laughs> but, but but no, like um, in our sequel, there were different characters who were in the town and the spiders had reemerged. And Shatner was this uh, hermit who no one knew much about who lived outside of the town, but he was the only guy who knew how to fight the spiders. And we learned like, oh, he dealt with them the first time around. Uh, in our outline, we never directly addressed how he escaped, but um, but he did. He was kind of like, Herbert Lom's Inspector Dreyfus in the Pink Panther <laughs> movie. It's like he would be destroyed at the end of one, and then in the next movie he'd be back in his suit at his desk. So. I, love it. I love it. Hey, at this point, we could probably, uh, you know, using all of this, you could have written a, a sequel to Horror at 37,000 feet. <laughs> I mean, who knows, if, who knows if, the, if, you know, the priest fell all the way to the ground at the end. I mean, yeah, I mean th- th- there had to be a return trip. opening shot giant (laughs) pile of hay yeah he's adjusting himself Ah! oh my god boy never when i thought i quit the priesthood i think i'd have this kind of adventure anyway let me walk to heathrow and see if i can get a ride back (laughs) okay let's take a peek i mean we are we're running crazy long but uh, this is just one of those shows that you just gotta love i love this show show. too much bill Actually, oh. never enough, Bill. Oh, is there ever enough, <laughs> Bill? Okay, so let's take a look. Oh, stop. Stop. I'm sorry. It's playing without me. Oh, stop that. Okay, here we go. Here we go. I got to get my share. Share screen. There we go. Yeah, you better share this one. I've been looking forward to it. <laughs> <laughs> this just seems like... I, I watched a little bit of it um, when I was like... 13 14 years old it was a late late movie um and but i could see it was so bad i'm actually kind of hoping i can find the scene that made me stop watching because (laughs) now it wouldn't make me stop watching when i was a kid i used to read famous monsters of filmland and i remember um they had a whole a whole issue devoted to this movie oh my god really Mm -hmm. that's amazing it looks like one of those Robert Rodriguez, Quentin Tarantino, fake beginnings. Yeah. Good boy. That's so true. Oh, this song. Oh, my goodness. Shining through the earliest rain. Oh my god! I mean, with, with the original score and the recycled Twilight Zone music we're going to hear later, <laughs> it's classic opera. So now, Joe, you know Arizona. Is this Arizona? <laughs> well, it, it, there's a resemblance. You know, and it was probably pretty cheap to film there at the time. Also starring, uh, starring Marcy Lafferty, uh, Mrs. William Shatner. <gasps> oh! Uh, <laughs> well, now I'm in. I'm so in. You're going to have to shoot me with a trank dart to get and me that, to stop watching this. That's Sammy Davis Jr.'s wife, uh, uh, Altavis, in- introducing. No way! <laughs> First and last film, I'm assuming. Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, it's, it's, it's film editor, Steve Zellin, isn't he? A- he became a director, didn't he? Or a screenwriter. Peaceful Verde Valley by Dorsey Burnett. Any relationship to Rocky Burnett, I wonder? Did you catch that, Chris? Yeah. Uh, uh, no, no. no uh, uh, he wrote the screenplay to, to Schindler's List after editing this movie. <laughs> and he wrote Gang, Gangs of New York, The Irishman. He's a, a Scorsese. Oh, my God. Writer. Wow. You think Marty ever would sit down beside him and be like, you came me with the spiders? Yeah, probably. <laughs> He's such a film geek, you know. <laughs> uh, was this a Roger Corman movie? Because because um, Scorsese was in that world. Oh, wasn't he? It, yeah, he was. was. Wow. I wonder if that's they kind of cross paths. So many filmmakers got their start. Yeah, like Jonathan Demme and... Uh, I'm mean, Ron Howard for that matter. Uh, yeah. Uh, eat my dust. Yeah. <laughs> yes, honey. Everything is looking good. 
There's Altavis, Sammy's wife. From like the professionals or one of the, those, you know, gang of cowboy guys. And that's uh, Woody Strode, former Olympian and co star Spartacus. Oh, yeah, Woody Strode. Yeah. And here, here's so, Bessie the cow about to get eaten by a bunch of spiders, I think. <laughs> Wow, a, a cow reaction shot. <laughs> I'm gonna look this up on doesthecowdie.com. Wow. <laughs> oh. Oh. Uh, wow. Spider POV shot. Fast spiders. This is a That's very so good actor count. <laughs> shot in muzzle mania. <laughs> All right, so that's Bill. Uh, right, go. Bill the equestrian. That's Bill himself doing doing the riding and the roping by the looks. Yeah. Barry, thank you for being with us for so long as you were. Hey, Barry. Have a good night, Barry. The rest later. <laughs> See you, Barry. It's late for Barry. Jesus, twelve thirty. It's crazy late. Yeah, he stayed up really late for us. Hold on, you. <laughs> so he's a vet. He's a horse Maybe. rider. Bill does it all. <laughs> of course, that cow would later die under mysterious circumstances. Yeah. That was adequate. Adequate? What are you talking about? <laughs> Damn good, you know it. That was adequate. And you know it. <laughs> what do you say, Steer? Uh, Steer says, mm, uh, give it a good job. <laughs> Bill ain't doing the boy voice over. Adequate. Adequate. Uh oh. Rack, you wouldn't dare. That's a sign of a healthy marriage right there. Oh, yeah. Oh, dear. Jeez. It's my lasso of truth I got from Wonder Woman. Hey, <laughs> Bill. Now, back in the day, consent wasn't what it was now. <laughs> what? I just remembered you're my sister. I'm impotent. Okay. <laughs> What? What's he mad about? I may be a lot of things to a lot of people, but I'm not my brother. Oh, she said the wrong name. Oh, what? Wow. Was this his sister-in-law? I guess. Maybe. Hansen, you have an emergency phone call from Walter Colby. <laughs> the CB radio on the horse just huh. came. Through. John isn't around anymore. Break a wind down, good buddy. Maybe it's time to get used to it. <laughs> We've got a difficult history. That's what you would write into a movie called <laughs> Kingdom of the Spider. <laughs> See, Chris, they wanted complicated relationships for yeah. Kingdom of the Spiders, yeah. too. Imagine, imagine this in Louisiana. <laughs> yeah, well, that's the thing. Crayfish and beers and... Yeah. I mean, he wouldn't get to ride his horses. He'd be like in a <laughs> canoe with a big stick. A big fan boat. I'm still not my brother. <laughs> I can imagine that one of the characters might have been eating some barbecue shrimp in Orleans and <laughs> took a big old bite of a big old tarantula. Oh, Service said you called. Yeah, I thought maybe it'd be best I come out here. You remember that camp I'm in spouting off about? She's real sick. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that one. What you got sick, Kevin? Nothing like this. Okay, everybody. Now just oh, remember, this cow's just an actor. Looks like she's walked into a harness nest. <laughs> Poor Bessie. I've seen nothing like it. Poor sweetie. They made her eat all those vanilla shakes. So she would get that frog. <laughs> a lot of money invested in that calf. Entered it in the county. <laughs> and there's the strap. <laughs> leg i'll let you know in a few hours 
if her legs turn black. Oh, this cow, this is killing me. What's on the, what's on the end of this Q-tip? <laughs> of course, the controversial cow swabbing scene. <laughs> yeah, Woody Strode carving something. Yeah. Give me the lab and flagstaff. Tell them I'm on my way. <laughs> no, are you telling me I got a real strike, you guys? What? Oh, did... Oh my God! I think we got kicked off the air. Oh, are we off the air? <laughs> oh, King no. of the spiders! Oh, wow! No, calf's dead, Lump. Ain't that a crock? I don't think, I don't think a crock is the right word. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I have to say, as much as I was bragging about. Um, using crash test to play mm -hmm. things i didn't do it for this movie because oh. I, I thought this movie wouldn't be protected it is you know this is a movie a couple of years ago got a dvd re-release by shout factory or something so oh, sure. i think do i think that and colombo is a popular stream show so they're going to be so so is this, are we are we just off the air um, we're possibly off the air. Uh, okay. Adina or uh, Stevie, would you give us a, a holler if we're still on? But uh, I think what they're looking at is a black screen. <laughs> Our screen got a case of the black leg. <laughs> Stevie, it's fine. I prefer it this way. <laughs> <laughs> But can they hear our audio or are the shows so? I'm not sure. I'm not sure if they can hear us. I I'm never quite sure what it's like uh when um when we get struck. Okay. And um and who knows what it will take to clean this up with um YouTube, but sometimes it's just I have to edit it out. Okay. And it's not impossible to do that. Well, it sounds like it was unfortunately it was the king of the spiders, which we never really got to got to the spiders for goodness sake. Uh oh, <laughs> Oh, this is terrible. Well, I mean, it happens. What are you going to do? And we are at over two and a half hours. Yeah, it's a pretty, <laughs> Honestly, pretty good haul. We, we've really, I mean, I, I thought I could actually tire out YouTube. I could actually make them go like, <laughs> ah, not worth it. <laughs> Let's just forget about it. Let them go. Uh, folks, you know, there's something that I should have done a lot sooner, and I'm going to do it now. And that is to remind you. Go to Joe This is for anyone who's watching the recording of this. But go down to JoeTazzle.com. Uh, Joe, you have a new book coming this fall. I do. Uh, Horror Springs Eternal, as the ad here tells us, it's going to be 13 Tales of Trial and Terror. And you know, there's some good ones. It's in the works. I think you'll enjoy. Absolutely. So be able uh, uh, to be sure. <laughs> Sorry, they're just killing me in the comments. <laughs> Try rolling into the car. <laughs> Jiggle it. <laughs> oh, oh, he's back. Oh, are you guys back with us? Oh, good. Yeah, they can't. You know what it was, John? It was that song at the beginning of the movie that got us kicked. <laughs> oh, I want. <laughs> I mean, that can happen. I mean, we've had trouble with music before. <laughs> Wow, <laughs> that could happen. Although, for all we know, this is a very owned film, and you know, I just wasn't supposed to be messing around with it like that. Uh, that's pretty much going to do it for this episode. Uh, oh, we should um, let you know uh, what's coming up. Um, uh, we are going to be doing uh, disco nights uh, next Saturday, as we have been doing uh, for the last three Saturdays. And uh, we're really kind of hoping that because this one's called Mirrors, <laughs> that they'll be going into the Mirror Universe and we'll get to see more Mirror Universe Star Trek, one of my favorite things about Star Trek. Same here. And uh, yeah, yes, Joe? Oh, just same here, sir. <laughs> and then uh, next Sunday, we're going to be joined by Stevie. Yay! Stevie is going to be. Uh, our guest, and we're going to be watching some very rare Boris Karloff television Ooh, wow. and clips. Cool. And um, 
Chris, there was we I never knew about it till we started doing research because we wanted to maybe get some horror guys on the show. And um this series, The Veil, was never aired. It it was it was an anthology show or just I've never heard of it. It it was hosted by Karloff. It was okay. an anthology show. And the one element that tied all the episodes together was, uh, for the most part, there were two episodes out of, was it 12 or 13? Do you remember, Joe? I think there was 13. Yeah. Typical half season deal, you know. Okay. And I, I believe only two of the episodes didn't feature Boris Karloff in the cast. Oh, okay. But for the most part, we'll be watching an episode that Kar Karloff is playing a significant role. Okay. And, the, and these, all, these all live on YouTube still? They're all on YouTube. Okay. Very easy to find. And uh, But we got to do the crash test because <laughs> <laughs> I thought for sure we wouldn't have a problem with this. But now I have to check everything uh, before it happens. But I believe, yes, we're going to be ending up with, uh, with Boris Karloff, who I just absolutely love. Boris Karloff is just one of my favorite actors. And um, it, it's funny because we were going to uh, yeah, test harder. Uh, we were go <laughs> we were going to do a uh, a Vincent Price episode too, uh, and we will later. But uh, there is a Vincent Price Boris Karloff musical number coming up next week. Wow. <laughs> When they were on um, uh, the Red Skelton show, they did a musical <laughs> number. <laughs> and it is oh, yeah. incredible. <laughs> so uh, that, yes, be be with us for that episode, and uh, I think that might do it. Uh, uh, Joe, anything you wanna you wanna close out with for the week? Oh well, I think I think you've said it all, John. I just, I will say this, Chris. Again, such a pleasure to meet and talk with you tonight. Likewise. I am in awe that you that you worked with William Shatner, and I am going to find me a copy of Shatner Rules. I'm going to read it because that sounds like it's just fascinating. Yeah, I hope you enjoy it. the the uh, the audio book is out there too. I remember um, we had scheduled two days for him to record it. He wanted to do it in one day, and uh, if you listen to the audio book, he is flying through it. But, okay. um, <laughs> but it, 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 it it's a it's a really fun quick read and. Uh, Everybody who read it, as far as I know, really enjoyed it. And it was a well-reviewed book. And, um, yeah, there, there are still copies out there. Um, and Chris, The resurgence themselves, I mean, for sure. Chris, where can people find you on your socials? What what socials do you Oh, I'm, I'm on Twitter still kind of at, uh, what am I, Chris R. Regan or I, I'm looking. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm at Chris R. Regan at, at Twitter. And um, yeah, just uh, watch Family Guy when, whenever you can. We're, we just uh, we just wrapped season twenty two or something. Oh and um, yeah, yeah, and we just uh, the other night had a very fun celebration at the Paley Center for our twenty fifth anniversary. Wow. And um, but yeah, you can you can follow me on Twitter and um, and just watch the show I work on because I like staying employed. <laughs> all right well thanks so much for watching the show uh in whatever form you're seeing it um i because we're definitely gonna have to edit out the kingdom of the <laughs> but that's, hey that's that's doing this show that's part of the process of this show chrissy th chris thank you so much for being on the show i i really enjoyed myself uh, uh, thank you for for having me i am not please going come to back as soon as you can I was about to say, I'm not going to pressure you by asking you to come back as soon as you can, but could you come back as soon as you can? Sure. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll, we'll see if we can get you in a couple of months at least. Uh, okay. Um, and thank you so much for uh, Stevie and Adina for uh, watching the show with us. Uh, you guys are just absolutely hilarious. And Barry that, and uh, Joshua are around too for, for quite a while. Barry and Josh doing doing great work. Uh, pitching in, making everything funny and fun. And uh, Joe Townsville, as always, thank you so much. Thank you for everything you do for this show. Oh, thank you, John. And uh, and that's going to do it. All right, everybody. See you next week. Grab your popcorn. Warm up your TV. Captain John Commander Joe got something to see. 
Retro Rangers are flying tonight. 